Greetings, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Dreamscapes. Today, we have our friend Joel Bouchard from West New York State. He is a uh, PhD psych student, army vet, and musician, uh, having produced some alternative or uh, psychedelic rock. You can find him out there. Also, the host of the podcast, From Nowhere to Nothing, available across uh, you know all major podcasting platforms. We're going to get right back to him in two seconds. Would you kindly like, share, subscribe, tell your friends about my channel. Always need more volunteer dreamers. Uh Hook yourself up before I get super popular, which any day now, right? And uh, you can get uh, one of my currently available 16 works of historical dream literature. The most recent is Dreams and Their Meanings by Horace G. Hutchinson. And uh, you can find all this and more at BenjaminTheDreamWizard.com, uh, including, you know, all 16 books, MP3 versions of these interviews, uh, you know, in audio-only podcast form, encyclopedia, uh, Lots of good stuff. So that's enough about me. Back to Joel. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, I, I, I we were talking a little bit before we started recording. Um, I'm somebody who has a lot of dreams and remembers a lot of them. Mm. And they've actually, um, in psychology, you're probably aware of it, they're, they're finding that there are some genes associated with being able to remember your memories, having better memory of your memories. So I don't know if I have it or not, but it's just kind of an interesting tidbit. It's very likely. I think there's a strong genetic or, or bio, at least biological component that's been long theorized. And I think rightly so uh, that that's, you know, it's basically what we are physically capable of kind of determines how we experience the world in a lot of ways. Um, and, and the un, unique range of dream experience that, that people have. Uh, some people can lucid dream. I think there's got to be something also semi-genetic there because I, then again, there's people who have the theory that you can train yourself to lucid dream. I wonder if the people who succeed and claim so had the predisposition and discovered it rather than uh, adopted it. So I, I yeah, don't know. yeah, I never put I never put any effort into it because it sounds like a lot of work. Like wake yourself up three hours in and, and start writing. I'm like, oh, I'm not. I, yeah. I need to sleep. Um, but yeah, no, there's a lot of interesting aspects to it. Um, I know in my particular case um i've always had a lot of dreams but um when i ran into sleeping issues and i got prescribed um frazidone which is mm. technically an antidepressant but it really ha has the effect of putting people to sleep more yeah, yeah. than it does reducing a nice drowsy feeling <laughs> yeah then um i started when they put me on that i started having dreams that were um subjectively in my dream time um weeks long two weeks long three wow. weeks long um and during those, some of those, I noticed that I couldn't lucid dream in the sense that I could control anything that was happening, but there were moments where I would suddenly realize that I was dreaming. Wow. Um, unfortunately, none yeah. of them were very exciting. Um, I was, I was, like you mentioned at the beginning, I was an army vet and um, two out of the four that I had were just um, me at army training exercises, sleeping in tents, stacking boxes, just mm. doing boring stuff for two weeks. And then oh, waking no. up and being like, wait, that was, that was a dream, you know, like, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's, um, dreaming has an interesting spot in, in psychology, as you probably well know. Um, but I've looked into it, you know, being a PhD student, um, in a lot of the literature in psychology, um, it's not taken very seriously. Uh, a lot of people, you know, it, in, with the, the foundations of psychology with Freud and Jung and some of them, it had some significance. And then in modern psychology, they started to say, "Ah, oh, no, it's just your way, your brain's way of getting rid of junk and stuff." Um, That's but I think that, yeah, I think <laughs> that they're starting to come back around to to seeing some of this as meaningful. And um, from a philosophical standpoint, which you know, philosophy kind of picks up where science leaves off in a lot of ways. Um, so that's in my my podcast is a philosophy podcast. So having the two sides of it for me the 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 background and the science of psychology but then also the interest and the the sort of the deeper dive into the philosophy of it um and understanding that science is never going to be able to answer all of your questions about things and especially something as subjective and personal as dreaming um there's no way of empirically proving much about it but you can rationalize about it and i think that that's where um things like what you're doing come in. And I think that there is something that is important and worthwhile for them. Yeah. There, oh, there's so much in there. I mean, going back a little bit to the idea of, um, oh, what was one of the first things you said? It was uh, something about, 
Ah, geez, I had it on the tip of my tongue. It was the history of studying. Oh, dreams. yeah, yeah, like the foundations of psychology. Like Freud yeah. and Jung um, looked into dreaming quite a bit. Oh, so we, that, that was actually like point two or three. I was going to try and get back. I didn't take any notes. I probably should have. I'm trying to follow along verbally. But <laughs> you, you mentioned, so going all the way back to the trazodone thing and how drugs of a variety of kind, food, uh, there's right. a long history of people believing bad dreams were caused by eating a rotten piece of meat before you went to bed, that kind of a thing. Mm. They people, So there's a long tradition of dismissing dreams as unimportant, just the vapors of a, of a bad meal. Um, but then there's also the idea of, of dreams that uh, the nature of how people individually experience dreams changing if they drink when they go to bed. Some people don't dream at all because uh, they're not hitting levels. You know, the alcohol is interfering. Uh, there's a guy who wrote uh, Confessions of an English opium eater and he described a lot of dreams especially with the time dilation stuff you were talking about where he would be trapped in these nightmares for what felt like to him centuries now I, and that that bring, that connects to another very interesting point you were saying too where dreams are all self-report i mean people could just be making this shit up but um, right. we, you know so everything we know about it is tell me what's in your head and what you remember of it so yeah, so yeah. Many layers. There's, there's a couple other interesting points there. You know, one is um, that idea that, you know, eating something can influence your dreams. Sure. Mm. Um, but what they're finding out um, biologically is that you have so much, so many serotonin producing, um, that you produce more serotonin in your gut than you do in your brain. Mm. And they're just, you're discovering that your, your gut actually has um, meaningful ways and impacts on how your brain works. You're, they're really discovering your body is a holistic system. It's this idea of your brain being this computer that's that controls the rest of your body. Right. It's kind of a false narrative. Yeah. You have <laughs> your heart, your gut, all kinds of you know, your whole body works together. And, and a lot of that influences your thinking just as much as your brain influences the rest of the body. For sure. Um, but and then the philosophical end of it is when you look at the self-report of dreams and, and time dilation um, from the philosophical point, I like to ask, well, what is time, right? Time yeah. is just, uh, <laughs> it's a, a construct. Um, many physicists don't even believe that it really exists. They believe we live in a what they call a block universe where the present, the past, and the future all exist at different times, um, just spread out throughout it. And time is just the way we perceive it with the three pounds of meat that's in our head. Yeah. Um, so in, if you think about it that way, the, the idea that in a 20-minute REM cycle, you could live centuries um, it seems strange from uh, just our sort of embedded uh, viewpoint of how we experience time in, in waking life. Um, but if you start to think about it a, a bit more abstractly and, and, and try to wrap your head around, well, what is time? We know that if you're having a good time, time moves very fast. Or if you're bored, yeah. time moves very slow. Time flies, I guess. So, yeah. There's some dilation there, even when you're awake, much, to a much lesser extent. Um, but yeah, it gets you asking some of those deeper questions. Dreams really get you very deep into the human psyche. Yeah, and there, there's also a very interesting phenomenon that um, I I don't know if it's been discussed much. I think I invented it, but I'm sure it's a, a concurrent thought that others have had. But the idea of time, your perception of time, being a function of your age. So one year to a 10 year old is one tenth of his life. One year to a hundred year old, one one hundredth of his life. So time seems to go faster as we get older as a, as a function of how long we've already been alive and how much time we've existed in general. Um, so that's, that's one, one way of looking at, you know, time being a subjective experience, even if it is an objective phenomenon, we, we, if we can prove that. Um, the second point though was, uh, so uh, an, an idea occurred to me just now, and that's why I love these conversations too, but the, the, the basic premise of the experience of time in dreams. And so if it goes down to some, some levels of my personal understanding of it from, from, from my own research and reading other people's work. So there's a basic idea, theoretical that, you know, we, we dream the entire night. Our brain never stops turning like the heart beats and the lungs breathe, but 
we don't always have a memory of every single thought. We don't have one eight hour dream that lasts the entire night as if we had never fallen asleep. We we fade in and out of them. So there's a kind of a liminal zone ish where it's not, we're not awake, but we're not so deeply asleep that we can't perceive ourselves thinking. And only, it seems to be only those experiences of perceiving our own subconscious thoughts that we call dreaming. So, mm. Okay, now how does this relate? This is actually coming back to what you said. That's all the the uh, wait. Let me begin at the beginning and then and then catch up. Um, so w- when you started describing the idea of being on, say, trazodone, I compared it to the guy who was on uh, the opium. Um, there may be a longer period of time, like your body may be struggling to awake or heading towards awakeness, and the substance is keeping you just under waking up where you're where you actually spend longer time in dreamland in in that in that space where you are consciously aware of your thoughts and i think a lot of people go you know um what is it a a a tremendous number of thoughts can tumble over each other in a five second span in a 10 second span you can take a 90 second cat nap and have a whole little fantasy dream adventure in your head and whoa come back come back awake so imagine, you know, you know, if we had a standard for it, you know, but uh, one minute of dreaming is one day in dreamland. The longer you're in that zone of I'm remembering what I'm thinking uh, from, uh, you know, uh, the longer it's going to seem. Uh, so we could we could have those kind of perceptions of, well, this is taking forever. I've been here my an entire lifetime. That's not an un, uh, unknown experience. Yeah, yeah. And that that would make total sense because my my particular problem with sleeping was I could always fall asleep quickly, mm. um, but then I'd wake up two thirty, three in the morning and I uh. wouldn't be able to fall back asleep. Um and of course being a psychology student, when they prescribe me trazodone, I started looking into it and, and the mechanics of how the drug works. And um they said basically exactly what you just said, which is that um it will keep you in in a, a, re- a restful state, a sleep state, um, but sometimes your sleep cycles will get interfered with. Mm. So very much like you said, rather than going from a core sleep to uh, you know a deep sleep, you know to a core to a REM, going through this kind of cycle, you might get caught in one place for an extended period of time, and that's that is how the dreams kind of happen. Yeah, and then the time thing that you mentioned, um, that has been studied psychologically, um, where they they say, yeah, if you're if you're five years old, then one year is twenty percent of your life. Yeah, Whereas yeah, yeah. if you're you know, eighty <laughs> years old, one year is so much. And the other part of that that they've looked at is in, as far as trying to figure out um, the subject, you know, sort of subjective feeling of time is um, novelty. Mm. You know, they say that novelty tends to slow down time greatly. And dreams, if much of dreams are very novel, you know, um, yeah. the, the dream I'll be sharing today is one that I've had probably a dozen times over my, the course of my life. But for the most part, every time you go to sleep, something new or different happens. And I think that novelty might play into um, the, for sure. if not the actual um, extent of the dream, right? Maybe, maybe I didn't dream for two weeks, right? Because I can't remember every detail of what happened, but the feeling of dreaming for two weeks yeah, and, and having that memory of falling asleep and waking up in a dream and, and going about my day and things that might have to do with the novel experiences that were happening, the things that I had never actually encountered in, in waking life. And so my brain is sort of paying attention to it saying, well, this has never happened before. We should, we should kind of key into what's going on. For sure. Yeah. And there's, there's two things that are pop, popped into my head. One of them is the idea of attention and distraction in a way like if we're staring a watch pot never boils we're staring at a clock just willing it to go faster because we're just bored out of our mind but we can't stop focusing on being present to the boredom and the slowness of the passage and what but then we get distracted by novelty by by this focus of attention into something that grabs our interest we have so many words that say what does it mean to be in to have interest to to be interested what is a you know and so that a lot of these phrases have been applied to dreams and attention and you know that uh, theories of, of dreams being um that we have to become disinterested in the waking world in order to fall asleep. That was one proposed theory of a certain mm. school of thought about how dreams function uh, or how, how we fall asleep. 
Ah, uh, shit. The other side of it was attention, focus, time. Damn. Now, what was the last thing you just said? Because it was, it was the time, and then you went into the perception of, of something else. Um, yeah. I'm so bad with yeah, um, verbally. No, but it, that that is really interesting because, again, this is where the, the psychology and the philosophy sort of meet is, mm. you know, much like time, trying to determine what time is. Um, you know, in psychology, they, there's a lot of focus. Um, the, the particular branch of psychology that I'm, I'm getting into is consciousness psychology. Mm. And it's sort yeah, of you the wild remember what west. I was going to say. Go ahead. I won't forget now. Yeah, it's sort of the wild west of um, the academic field at this point, consciousness studies right? is, is because there's theories all over the place. Um, people saying, um, oh, yeah, you know, consciousness is, is this, that or the other thing. But some of the interesting ones are when they say, oh, well, consciousness and they've done studies to, to sort of demonstrate this uh, is that consciousness happens after the fact, right? Like you and I think that we're here having a conversation. Um, and I think that I have control over what I'm saying, but in actuality, I'm saying things. And then retroactively, my consciousness is essentially a fancy memory system saying, okay, well, this is what you said. You're going to want to hang on to that for later to know if it was a successful course of action or if you'd want to say something different in the future. And then that's how it integrates its, its yeah. memory. The way that they demonstrated this was looking at a picture of a bee and tracking pupil movement. And what they found is that when you're looking at a picture, your eyes actually move too quickly for you to take in any information. So um, the way that you, your eyes move over a picture doesn't really make any sense for how your brain works. So all that information that's getting taken in sensory-wise, it, it takes up to 15 seconds for it to get fully integrated in your brain and to create a whole picture and to have a feeling of this. In yeah. the moment, you don't realize that. It's kind of like we were talking about before we started with um, latency. You know, like, okay, we set up these recording, uh, you know, get rigs where we're doing video or audio or something, and sometimes you'll say something and your voice will be just a split second behind will drive you nuts, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of people, you know, a lot of the science is saying that your brain sort of works the same way. You have all the sensory information coming in. And um, in the moment, you can't actually make sense of it all. It's actually a little bit later that you go, oh, wait, okay, this is what actually happened. Yeah. So um, that yeah, reminds the, me the, the whole uh, thing is fast. The, the, the but, double take phenomenon where we're like, yeah. what? And w what happened in between those two takes? We noticed something, but it took us a minute to process it, to look back and go, I'm startled by this. Uh, and that reminded yeah, yeah. me too, what, what, you were, what you were saying, the idea yeah, of, um, the amygdala, right. Where if, um, you know, you have that response where if something's coming at you out of the corner of your eye, you, you'll, re you'll flinch, you'll react, you'll try to get out of the way of something. You didn't think about doing that. You had no, you had no yeah. control over that. Your brain, it didn't make it to your prefrontal cortex. It made it to the, just the primal part of your brain. And then the signal got sent back down to, to take an action. Yeah, so, there is, and I, I am aware this, of some we have of that this stuff. Illusion of control a little bit, um, <laughs> and and how that plays into our our dreams and how we make sense of them is kind of interesting. Yeah, there wasn't there something if I if I recall it correctly, the idea of um, they did some kind of a mapping where it seemed like the hand moved and then the areas of the brain controlling hand movement lit up like afterwards there was something something in there it was a unique circumstance but it was that kind of automatic movement where it's like the brain didn't say move hand the hand said by the way i just moved <laughs> and there was something yeah. else what what was that if it's not coming from the brain you know uh you know it uh it seems like our we we focus yeah as you say a lot you want to get down what are you doing bubble he's he's the real star of the show everything stops when he wants to <laughs> get into a new position um you know, we, we think of the brain as, as just what's going on up here, but it's actually connected in that network that, you know, the very famous picture of it, like you take the brain and the nervous system out and it looks like this weird octopus alien that's just floating there. Uh, and then that's, what's living inside us that kind of moves the rest of it. Um, but to get back to, before I completely forget the idea of, um, consciousness and that's, I don't think you can develop a theory of consciousness that does not account for dream experience because we know it's real. We know it's ubiquitous. It's, it is something that happens with humans. That's why I have my uh, little branch of what I'm trying to put together of like, I think, and you can, you know, take this for what it's worth. It's a work in progress. Uh, and, I, and I mentioned this in the last episode, uh, but I think 
or it seems likely to me, or I get the impression, whatever, however you want to tentatively say it, that dream experience is more like actual thought, unfiltered Mm -hmm. by conscious attention. I think that's, I'm leaning in that direction, theoretically. The idea that what we do is that our our actual, the way our brain actually functions and the way we process ideas and images and sensory impressions and all this other stuff, that stays the same. The only thing that changes is the, the outside world goes away and our conscious attention goes away. And then what we're left with is the unfiltered stuff. You know, and this maybe is accounted for by just the the theory of the subconscious. Although some people think of it as, they they confuse it with um, its own entity in a way that has a will or a desire that communicates things to us, which is one way of conceptualizing it. But I, so why why so how does this relate to consciousness and why is was dreams important? But it's a very unique phenomenon where we are both storyteller and observer, and the observer part doesn't know what the storyteller is going to say or do, and the storyteller. Mm-hmm may not even be aware there's an observer. Uh, it's this weird dual, and that, well, they, they posit ideas of dual consciousness. It goes way back in, you know, late, um, you know, early to late or mid, whatever, uh, 1800s uh, type of stuff. And we've gotten a little bit away from that. They used to think of, you know, each half of the brain had its own consciousness. That was p- part of that stuff. And some of these theories, really weird, fell out of favor, but they were never really disproven. People just said, well, we like this other theory better. Uh, a lot of people don't know that discrete areas of the brain controlling different areas of the body or processing sound or, or et cetera, et cetera. That actually came from the phrenologists, the people that used to measure the shape of the skull and whatnot. And it's funny to see that that part of that fell away and got poo-pooed because it was, you know, all kinds of like social dynamic stuff built into it that was discriminatory, et cetera, et cetera. But they were the guys that said, yeah, each area of the brain has its own function. And we, you know, and now that's just taken for granted. It's proven. We know look lights up auditory processing. There it is. So, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. The history of psychology is really kind of interesting because I think if you look at it as a whole, um, you had a group of people at the beginning that were sort of intuiting the way that the brain worked. And then, um, what happened is, as as the field became more scientific, um, they found that some aspects of what those guys discovered um, didn't pan out. Mm. So what they did is they got rid of all of it, and then yeah. they transitioned into a purely empirical model that was mostly based on, um, you know, uh, sort of deterministic, um, mechanistic um, nature or nurture conceptions, which is a long way of saying either stimulus response or um, genetics could account for all behavior. Mm. We are basically just meat machines, right? And yeah. we just react to what's going on around us. Um, and that really dominated the psychological field um, through most of the 20th century, right? Um, it wasn't until really as recent as 20, 30 years ago um, that psychologists started to look at it and say, you know what, this these models don't account for the human experience. And some of those early guys that we threw everything out from, there was some stuff that should be thrown out, but there were other things that had some weight to them. And as they started to, you know, clinically observe um, some of these extreme cases, you know, ones that it would be ethically impossible to um, create this experiment, but if it occurs naturally, it provides a lot of insight. They started to discover some of those things are true, um, like... You can watch videos on YouTube of people who have had um, lobotomies or even like a corpus callosum severing, mm-hmm. um, and they'll say, hey, draw a cat, right? And there's this lady, and she perfectly draws half of a cat, the right half of a cat. And um, they say, do you like this cat? Does it look good? Is it complete? Yeah, yeah, it's good. good. Say, so, you know you didn't draw the left half of the cat. And she goes, Oh, yeah, um, you know, I must have forgot or it must have been the way or something. So the way that the brain communication works when you sever those connections, um, she can think that she did something right. And then once pointed out, she can know that she did it wrong, but she can't do the both at the same time. Or, you know, there's obviously documented cases of people with multiple personality disorder, which is kind of like you were saying, this idea of separate consciousnesses, right? Your your brain um, categorizing um, and, and splitting off these different things. 
and that's sort of i think and that's some of the current um theories on on dreaming uh postulate that that's that's kind of what's happening when you're dreaming um you're not creating a new personality but your what your brain is saying is all right hey we've got some downtime um we know what our regular waking life is and we want to survive and adapt to that experience um but we're pretty comfortable with what's happening normally but what we really need to do is sort of run some thought experiments and see mm -hmm. if something novel happened during that experience, how would we react to it? Right. For sure. And so you have these dreams where um, there's always elements that are familiar to you. Um, but then there's some elements that are um, sometimes they're scary. Sometimes they're strange. Sometimes they seem normal, but they're just a little bit off. And that's your brain's way of saying, Hey, you know, if some, how would you react to this situation and how, how are we going to use that in our waking life? So yeah, the Absolutely. psychology of dreaming has really um, come a long way, you know, where it's it started out um, with some good stuff and some bad stuff. Then all of it got thrown out. Everything started from the beginning. Then they they threw a lot of that out <laughs> and then they went back to the beginning. And so it's sort of been a, a patchwork throughout. So and that's why I always, um, you know, some people uh, I I hesitate to even as a Ph.D. student, right, to say you to jump on this bandwagon of saying, well, you know, if it's, if it's not scientific, then I'm not interested in it. Right. Because yeah. science is a process, right. It's, it's, it's a very, there's a, it has a very distinct description of a, obtaining knowledge. Um, but you can't run every, nothing, not everything can be run through that process and knowledge be gained that way. And like yeah. we we're talking about dreaming is one of them. It's very subjective. It's all self-report. You can't design an experiment to prove that anybody dreams. So you need to come into knowledge about it a different way, and that's usually through rationalization, philosophizing, um, having um, um, an idea of symbol, you know, symbolism, and these sorts of things. So. Definitely. Yeah. And that, again, I've got at least two things there. I'm going to try and say them first so I don't forget them. Um, the idea, whoa, just saying that, I think I forgot it. Uh rationalize oh the utility of dreams it's like uh you know why bother why bother how do we know that a dream is um important and and needs some kind of interpretation my my theory is dreams self select for importance if you wake up from a dream and it has a lingering emotional impact if you think about it throughout the day and it's very puzzling there's something that draws you to it there's probably some important Maybe not a message. Messages that, that, that seems like a, a um, giving, again, giving the subconscious a, a, a personality that has intent in, in a way that it really doesn't. But something meaningful exists within that, some concept, some problem you're trying to solve. And I think that's my also my current theory of uh, recurrent dreams is that it is the kind of the crystallized, iconic representation of a certain kind of problem that you haven't found a good answer for over time. And so that formula comes back to say, okay, we're back. We're back here dealing with this again. What, what if it happens this way? What do, if we return to the, exactly what you say. I think of it as thought experiments. We're giving ourselves license to imagine. It's like we daydream during the daytime. What would I have said in that conversation if I had, now that I've had time to think about it? I think it's very similar to that, that kind of experience. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, some of the modern psychologists take that, oh, well, you know, it's just your brain getting rid of junk information at, at night. That's all so it is. So dismissive, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, you know, when I look at it, so my my dad died a year and a half ago, right? Mm. For probably a month or two after that, I dreamed of him every single night, mm. every single night in different scenarios. Him and I, he, we worked together. And so I we were at work, we were at home, we were in situations we had never been in. Um, having conversations we never had, conversations we always had, just running through all these different things. And you go, why would that happen if it didn't mean anything, right? Yeah. And like you said, you don't, you don't have to make it um, a big mystical or, um, you know, strange thing. But all you have to say is, if subjectively, right, if, if my mind is choosing to focus attention and focus on this um as person and so if everybody has the same experience 
then dreams are important. It's really rationally, it's that simple, but yeah. it has an impact on our lives, right? I, I think that a lot of people will have a dream and it has the ability to give, you know, wreck your day or puzzle you or, you know, whatever the case may be. So yeah. they have tangible impacts on our, our everyday life. For sure. And that's where I was going with the idea of the uh, utility of it is that if it self-selects and you pay some attention to it, you'll probably figure out a solution that way you which couldn't come to you. And I, I say this too, it's like, uh, once upon a time people used to say, eh, sleep on it, you know, in a sense of don't make a decision now, give it some time. I think, no, literally sleep on it. Give yourself that uh, opportunity to process it unconsciously and, uh, come back to the problem tomorrow, not just getting distance from it, but really sometimes there's a grand trick of reading all these books. I love it. 16 currently available works of historical dream literature. As I say, uh, there is a grand tradition of, people finding solutions to problems in their dreams. Now also having dreams where they imagine they were a great poet and they wake up the next morning and try to write down what they remember. It was just crap. It was like, but it felt so good. I thought it was so good in my dream, but then other real solutions. Um, it wasn't Edison. It wasn't Tesla. It was someone else, but had some solution to a mechanical problem come, come to him in his sleep. Um, for, for all that we take it for granted, these are not, you know, apocryphal stories. Um, so the utility of it can literally be you solve a problem or it can be more of a personal understanding of something that lets you ease up the need to uh, spend mental bandwidth on something because you don't have to process it, process it anymore. You've got it resolved. You can put it to rest. You can put some new plan into effect. Um, that was continuation of the oh, so second point. Uh, <laughs> um, dreams of the dead. Also, a grand tradition of that, going back like to the to the Greek and uh, you know, Greek playwrights, uh, you know Homer's Odyssey. What is it? The um, Patroclus comes to Achilles as as a vision, as a dream, and motivates a choice for him. Did did was it a vision sent from the gods? I mean, that's kind of how they conceived of it. Is you know supernatural forces, um, but there's also in in recent years this idea that most of the what it seems from what I've read, most of the dreams of the dead are not terrifying. They're comforting. There's because we love these people. And for a little while we get to imagine they're still with us. And that's where mm -hmm. most dreams of the dead, they're not ghost dreams. They're not boogeyman dreams as much as I spent time with my dad again, because he, because that made me happy. And if you can experience that in dreams, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to make it stop unless it's affecting your daily life and causing you stress in other ways. But why not just have a nice experience? Uh, we, we get to be with our deceased loved ones again in, in our dreams because why wouldn't we, you know, and the idea that especially after immediately having been deceased, you don't want to like, Oh, you, you can't believe he's gone. So you're just going to choose not to believe he's gone for a minute <laughs> and, and draw some yeah, com yeah. comfort from that. Yeah. Yeah. No dream. Uh, yeah. Utility of dreams. That is a really interesting topic. I think my favorite one was, I can't remember which Apollo it was, but it was one of the Apollo missions might've been 13 mm -hmm. um, where they had a catastrophic problem. And it was time sensitive. I think that they had to fix this problem within an hour in order to, you know, survive. And um, the the captain of the the mission was talking back to um, Earth. He said, "All right, let me take a nap." And they're like, "What are you talking about? We don't have. You can't take a nap." He said, "No, just give me ten minutes." And uh, he took a nap. He woke up and he had the solution to the problem. And he fixed it. Right? Yeah. Um, I've never had anything that critical. But like, I always tell people um, with school, right? I've I've got a 4.0, um, and I always tell me I know I've never taken a note, not a single note ever. Um, what I do is when I'm reading a textbook, I'll read for 15 minutes, you know, get up, take a break, read for another 15 minutes, mm. get up, take a break, 15 minutes. Then after three or four cycles of that, I'll take a 15 minute nap, right? <laughs> I'll go to sleep okay. 15 minutes, wake up, start over again. And it's all there. Like I just, I remember it. And if I miss that, if I don't take the nap, I find myself going, all right, well, what was that I just read? Or I'll read a sentence and go, oh, I got to read that again. Because they're discovering that you have a limited well of mental energy. And especially when it comes to something um, that's very high level like this, you know, um, PhD studies where, uh, you know, the, the more attention you're paying to something, the more focus, the more effort you're putting into it. Chess masters, they'll find these guys will actually lose weight just playing a chess game. Burning calories. So much there. energy yeah, yeah. going on, right? Um, that you can exhaust that well pretty quickly. And the only way that you get it back is through sleeping. 
you know, so I'm a big fan of napping. <laughs> yeah. And that, that goes back to the early philosophy of sleep. Like it seems like something that's not optional for people. Uh, and we've proven mm -hmm. that in terms of like you, just, you develop psychosis, but, uh, and, and that was the, um, early theories as well. The, the idea of, I think it goes, uh, I don't know which post, you know, Roman empire think thinker it was that was talking about this, but oh, that, that links to another idea too. But they used to conceive of sleep as what happened when the energy reserves of an organism were exhausted and then they had to recharge. And I mean, that's a fine conceptualization. That's how we kind of how we do, but, um, that, uh, that also, it, it, speaking of your idea of the memory thing, I've got, I've got a terrible memory, terrible verbal processing, better at reading, but sometimes I need a long time to read, think, read it again, start writing, go back and read it, make sure I'm answering what I, th you know, like a replying to, to something, a philosophical type of thing. Uh, so there's a long process with that for me, but that seems an, uh, an interesting way to let the let's say if we use the computer processing or com computer function, you get your RAM and you get your hard drive space. So sometimes that um, just piling more and more information into the RAM, it gets full and then it starts leaking out. And as you add new stuff, the other, like a sponge, the other stuff falls off. But if you take a break, it gives your brain a minute to move it over into storage. And now you get RAM mm -hmm. again. Uh, so there's, there's very much something conceptually there and something else I was going to say, Oh, diagnosing physical. So the utility of dreams, diagnosing physical problems from dreams. So we talked about the idea of, um, serotonin coming from the gut say and if you have a indigestion that can lead to physical discomfort that can show up in your dreams it can bring you out of deep sleep and into that liminal zone and even wake you up entirely various physical sensations in sleep so they've had historical cases of people who dreamed um one of the, one of the famous ones was they were driving a carriage with horses and they're whipping the horses and driving the horses are panting and sweating and they're driving them uphill. And it turned out that guy had a heart condition and they diagnosed the heart condition related to the dream. They're like, well, let's look at what causes heavy sweating and panting. And yeah, you don't look so your power's not good. Let's check your heart. Um, so there's a long tradition of that too. Sometimes if you pay attention to your dreams, you'll get dream imagery from physical sensations, a mosquito bites you in your sleep or internal diagnostics that might be relevant Now, how to tell the difference. I'm not sure yet. I'm not going to pretend to be, uh, you know, magical in that, in that regard too. But if you got something that yeah, worries but... you and you can lean into it and understand that seems to say something, maybe you go see a doctor and you get something checked out. Yeah. I think that most people, I think most people have had experiences with this though. Um, and then there's terminology for it, right? A fever dream. Yeah. You, you think that the sort of dreaming you have while you're having a fever and it does seem like it's your brain's way of trying to say, oh, man, something's wrong. Like yeah, it's very I, surreal. <laughs> most of mine, when I have a fever dream, it's that I'm working. I never dream about my jobs normally. But when I have a fever dream, I'm always just working as hard as I can at my job. You know, and I go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it's this busy. It's never this busy. And I'm sweating and I'm running around and stuff. You yeah. Know? Well, that's your body trying to fight off an infection. You know, your, your body <laughs> temperature is going up. Your, your, your everything's raised, you know. So I, I think there is something to that. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's, I just have an endless fascination. Well, partly because I think honestly, you know, uh, I developed, um, I discovered I had a kind of a knack for it in the, in the symbolic association thing. And then I'd let it go for years. This was back, back in, back in college. Um, man, I can't brain today. I had a sec, I had a, I had a whole point to that sentence. I discovered I had an act for it. Oh, and I don't, remember my dreams like hardly at all like you as much as you are a prolific dreamer with great recall my memory's crap and i think i sleep so deeply so i have, I have actually the opposite problem is once i fall asleep i'm good i'm sleeping like a like a log falling asleep is terrible for me without some kind of a you have to take melatonin or whatnot um but that also means that when i get into sleep i'm like deep and i, I woke up like what is it what is it today as um you know, I have, I have, a, I have a, a vague impression of sitting at a park bench and someone was showing me a container with pills in it or something. And it was in the broader context of something else. And there was some discussion over whether to use it for some purpose or whether it was dangerous. I, I mean, I don't even know, it, but that's mm -hmm. all I got. And there's nothing but that. Now you can actually do something with that. Um, 
but still without much else context going on. And I don't have a story to tell. Um, so, you know, really that's where I shine a little bit is where if someone can give me a bit of a narrative beginning to end what happened and then we go through it and we try and figure out what is this trying to say about a particular experience you're having or a problem you're trying to solve, um, you know, w the potential for heart disease, <laughs> et cetera. Yeah. It's funny that, that we're almost diametrically opposed in, in, yeah. in our, how we experience that because, um, you know, our, even, even our two sleep problems are different. I fall asleep easy, but I can't stay asleep. Yeah. I remember my dreams very well. A lot of them, a lot of them are very detailed. Some of them, it's, it's kind of like you were saying, just sort of a vague impression, but, um, I cannot, I cannot like interpret any of my dreams. So I, I know all the symbolism, but I almost wonder if it's one of those things where it's, it's so vivid and it's so real that I'm almost too close to it to try to make any sense out of how it symbolizes something. It seems to be a, a real thing within itself rather than a symbol for something. So I look at it and I go, yeah, man, what, what does that mean? It's, it feels like it means something and it <laughs> seems very vivid, but I have no idea what it, what it represents, you know, for sure. And you know, as much as I, I I'm undecided ultimately, part of most of me wants dreams to be understandable to the person by some kind of process you can do yourself. That is, I would, uh, you know, eventually someday we'll write a book, how to, you know, a wizard's guide to dream interpretation. And here's how you do it yourself at home. You don't need me because I hope someday I won't be able to talk to everybody. And, and I don't want to, I don't want to, it also seems very hubristic or whatever, uh, you know, self aggrandizing to say, well, you need me because I'm good at it. It's, it's not like that. It's, but, but, the other half of me is like saying sometimes, yeah, we are too close. And what you need is you just need someone to work with and it doesn't have to be me. It can be anybody you could, I, you know, so there might be a method in there and I'm going to lean in to try and find that. So how do people do this at home with a friend? What, what's a good way to just start talking it out and having them make suggestions and um, based on what they think, you know, and it may take, I honestly, it is a, a bit patting myself on the back. I think I do have some, unique innate talent. I've developed it. I've leaned into it to try and become better at this. So maybe someone at home wouldn't have the same results or close to as good, but my mind might be better, but I'm, I'm hoping that something I can discover through this through the investigation and education, all this trying to build my own master's degree in dream interpretation, self-taught, so, so to speak, uh, that I will be able to give that back at some point and, and tell people how to, but then some dreams maybe just can't really be seen because they're too close and you got to get someone with distance. I, I, I use the analogy of like, you need a mirror to see the back of your head, or you can have a friend look and tell you if your haircut's straight. You just need right. some external thing to give you that reference. Um, yeah. 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 So I'm really interested. Um, and you know, and like I said, I, I'm a, I'm a very creative person. So like, like I said, I've got, um, you know, music online. I play all the instruments. I write all the songs. Um, I like to paint. Um, I like to write, you know, I'm, I'm currently writing a, a philosophy book with my co-host, but I'm, I've also written some, some works of fiction and things. So the creativity is there and you know, the, the thought process is there, but, but the, just trying to interpret them is, is very difficult. Yeah. But I, you know, I, you know that there's something there because like I was talking about reading, you know, reading school, a school book, right. I'll read for a long time. Then I'll take a nap and usually 15 minutes tops. Um, but as soon as I close my eyes, I'll be dreaming. Mm. And most of the time it doesn't have anything to do with what I was reading. It's something completely random, completely strange. But then when I wake up, I understand what I read, you know, and I've had it happen with the same, like you were saying before. And I think there's some research looking into it with the default mode network of your brain, um, which is the, the thing that works in the background um, and the thing that gets affected by um, like taking psychedelic mushrooms or these sorts of things where um, if you're not focusing on a problem, but the problem exists. You've, you've focused on the problem. You know it exists. Now you're focusing on something else. You can, your brain is working in the background to solve that problem. And yeah. so lots of times, that's how I've written songs is, is through that, that sort of thing. I'll, I'll go, okay, well, I've got this piece of something and this piece of something, but I can't figure out how to connect it. 
and then I'll I'll go to sleep for the night or I'll take a nap or I'll start doing something else and then I'll wake up and I'll just know. I didn't dream about it. I didn't dream about connecting the pieces. But also I'll wake up and I'll just know how they connect. Um so yeah, it's interesting. What what's happening while you're sleeping, yeah. what's happening while you're dreaming, how the pieces connect, you know. Sometimes all we can do is try to analogize it. I I literally call that process percolating, like you're making coffee. Mm-hmm. It's just got to sift through and eventually you got, you know, uh, 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 hot dirty water with a buzz. Um <laughs> it, yeah, and it just uh, it and it that happens all the time. Sometimes you just put something on a shelf, you say, okay, I'm going to do something else for a minute, but it's still there. That background process. I mean, we, we come up with so many different forms and terminologies. We, you know, we, a few years back, we might say, well, that's just the subconscious. That's what you're talking about. But is it? Or is it? Is it um, a dual consciousness, the way a conscious attention and subconscious uh, focus? Like, And what is... What is that focus? What keeps it moving while we're not looking at it, while we're not spinning the wheel on purpose? Uh, I don't know that we're ever going to know. There's some weird metaphysical questions that get into that is like, uh, are we just the sum total of electrical impulses and biochemical reactions passing through our body? Or is that the evidence of something else intersecting with our physical body and the result is what we can see? You know, are we what we can see or are we the result of something we can see and something we can't see? I mean, that is ultimately yeah, and that's, maybe that's where that that field of consciousness studies gets really yeah. weird because you hear this stuff and you would think, oh, OK, man, like this sounds like something a crackpot would say. But here it is in a scientific <laughs> journal right? or stone. Um, Dude, wait, I just had an even, idea. Right. <laughs> even with outside of like just the electrical signals that are inside your body, some of the some of the theories now in consciousness are actually saying that. Your consciousness is generated by a quantum field that's outside of your body. So there's there's a, a quantum wave collapse of microtubules in your brain mm-hmm. um, that, that originates from outside of your body. You're like, okay, that just sounds totally insane. But they're looking at ways of, of designing experiments to try to establish some support for these theories. So, yeah, consciousness is just... Well, it's it's the wild west nobody knows what to think and everybody's trying to develop theories but one thing that is sort of it's gaining um acceptance throughout the field is that sleeping and dreaming is a form of consciousness um, yeah. which is something that if you would have said 50 or 60 years ago people would have in the field would have laughed in your face they get that definitional said, no, dichotomy not, yeah. how can you be conscious when you're just laying there not moving not uh, you know unable to react to anything that's happening around you um but the modern um take on it is well no if if you're experiencing something if the only thing that's different is like you said earlier that the outside reality isn't there but the subjective reality is just as real as anything else you've ever experienced that's consciousness that's a conscious experience yeah and it gives us very unique abilities to make assumptions like thought experiment style. So I've, I've said this before with, with some folks too, the ex- dream experience of seeing a car go over a cliff and explode at the bottom is exactly the same as standing there and knowing there is a car at the bottom of that cliff that just fell over and has exploded. You don't have to see it. You can just know things in your dreams. And it's kind of like we say, okay, uh, take it for granted that uh, there's a trolley on the tracks and you have to pull a lever. Go. Uh, how did the trolley get there? Did I see the trolley coming? How did the people get there? You know, that kind of thing. Doesn't matter. Thought experiment. Go. Desert Island. <laughs> we do yeah. that all the we do yeah. that all the time. And I think that the context of your dream can affect how real it seems. So mm, yeah. Um, like I was saying, um I've never I've never lucid dreamed in being able to control a dream. Um, but in one of those long dreams, when I realized I was in a dream was I was stacking boxes for the army, right? And in my dream, I remembered hearing somewhere that in a dream, you can't read. And I don't even know. I don't even think that's true, but I heard it somewhere. Right. Yeah. And so all of a sudden I looked at the box and I realized that all the words on the box were nonsense. They weren't anything. And I go, oh, man, I'm dreaming. And um, as a result, when I woke up, I wasn't surprised that it had been a dream, even though it had lasted for so long. But I had another dream. And it was this was the first multi-day dream I ever had. I went to sleep in real life. I, and then when my dream started with me waking up in my same bed, I went about my day and some weird um, 
some weird thing happened where me and my friend ended up robbing a bank in my dream. <laughs> and we decided that I would take the money home and hide it under my bed. So I took the money home, I hid it under my bed, and then I went in my bed and was just so scared that the police were going to show up. And I fell asleep in my dream, and then I woke up in real life in my bed. And I jumped out of my bed and looked under to see if there was money under there. I was so afraid that I was going to go to jail. And there was no money under there. And there was, there was a period of time for about 30 or 40 seconds where I was very confused about what was going on before I realized that it was just a dream where entering the dream and exiting the dream happened so matched up so well that my brain was having an almost impossible time differentiating reality from waking, you know? So I think that context of, of what happens in the dream and, and how you transition really has a big effect on how real you perceive the dream as being as well. Very much so. Yeah. And the dream within a dream phenomenon too is, is very interesting as well. Like, uh, and that goes, connects also to the idea of the theory that possibly lucid dreaming is simply the belief that you are aware you are dreaming. But, but in regards to the reading thing, there is a historical record, so to speak, that many people read in dreams. They have the experience of looking at a sign and knowing what the words mean, but that upon inspection, you know, some people who've, who've gone closer to look at things in dreams, look at a page and the words are gibberish, not even real characters of the language they speak or strung together in any coherent way. Sometimes it's just uh, bl a blur of what looks like text. So there is there's kind of a kind of a consistent phenomenon across time of of us not reading per se in the dream state and what that is. I don't know, but it's a it's a real thing. Yeah, and I. And that's the feeling that I had doing it was because it seemed like in that dream up until that point, I had been reading the boxes fine, but was I reading the words or was I just looking at the gibberish words and assigning them a meaning, you know, which is really, I mean, if you think about reading again, philosophically, what are letters, what are symbols and, <laughs> and how does our brain make the meaning that it makes out of them anyways, yeah. right? So that's already a pretty abstract thing. Um, but I think in your dream, it, it just gets even more abstract where you look at the symbols and you say, okay, I know what those symbols mean. But then if somehow in your dream, it occurs to you that those symbols don't have meaning, all of a sudden the illusion sort of disappears, right? Yeah. Um, and I read a, I can't remember where the article was, but it was in a major news outlet recently. Um, there it was a person talking about lucid dreaming and how it's not really all it's cracked up to be. They said, sure, I can fly and stuff, but... Um, my brain just can't fill in all the details. They said, you know, in a dream, when you don't lucid dream, when you just dream regularly, you wake up and you, you think that everything was as it is in real life um, and that you just can't remember some of the details. But this person's experience of it was that the details actually weren't there. They said that everybody looked like they just had faces kind of pasted over them or that the grass was all, you know, sort of like a, like a video, you know, like a nineties video game, right. Where everything has like the two dimensional textures, you know, it was like the details were actually missing in their dream when they were consciously able to perceive it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it, that's an interesting sort of take on it too, is what is your brain doing to create this world? Because without the outside stimulus that we have in waking life, it's really up to your brain to, to invent all of that and how good of a job can it do um, and how well it can it convince you of it is, is kind of an interesting thing. How, much, how well can it convince you of it versus how well can it just um, pull a magic trick to convince you that you're experiencing it? It's kind of funny. Yeah, definitely. And that, well, there are two things there about the uh, detail and then another thing about the reading and language in general. Um, there's uh, very often the circumstance where things are relevant because they're missing or they're not relevant. So they're missing. And it's teasing that apart is maybe take some part of the, part of the, uh, the uh, art and the science, so to speak. Um, but also there's a, a, a pretty regular occurrence of sudden scene changes. We, we kind of encapsulate one type of idea or process of thoughts. And then suddenly we're somewhere else. And it's like, 
not even a fade to black. It's just a sudden jump cut. And now mm. we're somewhere else doing something else. And there's no need for the, there's no need for the continuity of, and now I got on a train and I traveled 300 miles east and now I'm in a different location. No, I'm just in, I'm in a different location. Done. Uh, so the, uh, not only yeah. does time get dilated or compressed, but space is irrelevant as well. Cause, and it's the fantastic thing. It's all imaginary. It's all, it's all literally so you can think anything you want as fast as you want within, within limits. But, um, so that's that. Yeah. And I like that part in the movie inception where, um, he's teaching the student to dream and he goes, dreams are funny because you always start right in the middle of them. And he goes, think, yeah. how did you get here? How did you arrive at this cafe? And she goes, well, I just came from, and she doesn't know, you know, <laughs> and that's the way a lot of dreams work. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, one of them that I, I, I try to write down the ones that I think are, are real interesting. One of them that I had written down, it is a lot of just that jump cutting, right? Like one. And like you said, there's, there's no, um, you don't have to have any logical reason for why it happened or a, a sequence of events or anything. Yeah. It's just, okay, well, I was doing this. Now I'm doing this, you know, and that's just <laughs> the way it goes. For sure. And then just, the, well, the last thing about that before I, before I forget is the, because it is such a consistent phenomenon, the idea of not being able to visually display to ourselves printed words. I wonder if there's a, it feels to me like there's something relevant there in terms of our thought process as such, like as it occurs. And this kind of goes to my broader theory of the idea that we think more in images, sensations, impressions, feelings, connections, rather than, and then we, we filter that through our conscious attention and we can kind of zoom in and uh, what, what is the, uh, with the, the CSI enhance, enhance, and we can go down further and further and fill in more details. Um, so we've got that element to it, but but that we filter the 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 way we actually think through our conscious attention and turn that into language and symbols and and stuff. So I'm not conceptualizing that or expressing it correctly, but there the fact that a written language symbols so are so ubiquitous ubiquitously missing from people's dreams says something about the way we actually think is not we don't think in language in that way we actually have to yeah, translate our thoughts into language and then put them into speech and get them out of if am i making sense or you have something to say about no that? no that actually just gave me a great idea yeah. for a science experiment yeah yeah, yeah. and <laughs> it, it's actually so good that i shouldn't mention it but because it's okay to keep it quiet it, but... i won't i won't press you um no, i would like no, to study I, a lot of I, these I, things but i'd rather just see the field advance and yeah, personal yeah. glory for myself but i would i it would be fascinating to see if they did a study fMRI, right? So you put the electrodes on somebody's brain, you let them fall asleep, and then you examine what's going on in Broca's and Wernicke's area in the brain, which are the brain regions responsible for, for understanding language, right? What is going on in those brain areas during a dream? Are they even lit up? Or is one or the other lit up? Or, you know, how are they inter interacting in a way? And I wonder if that would shed any light on why written language is so difficult to comp not difficult to comprehend but difficult to perceive in a dream yeah, as a visual right? experience you can comprehend as we written read language letters on text perceiving yeah perceiving it which is just kind of a, a mind-boggling thing but. for sure and then the, the the um there must be something distinct about the area of of processing written symbolic language characters and verbal processing because we have very often distinct impressions of and then this person said these exact words and i heard it now mm. why would we be able to say hear a spoken language in a way that we cannot read a written language in in such a clear mental image very strange it's like we, it's not like we've never seen words on paper before and we couldn't maybe conjure that image as a as in our sleep if it was necessary um yeah of all the wild things your brain does in a dream <laughs> how can it not recreate written language you know yeah it's kind of funny. yeah and, and it would be interesting to see maybe okay maybe we've got a handful of people they can they have a very distinct impression of written characters the a stop sign it was big and red and i saw the s and the t and the o and the p all brightly now then again there's are we seeing that as a visual image of a picture a symbol versus 
text like reading a book. I don't know. But uh, if we could find those people who do, what then would be the difference? Why can some people do it and other people can't? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's fascinating. I'd rather we get more into understanding how dreams work than, say, inventing AI to start imitating human thought. I don't know if that's a good idea. I, right. I, I don't get political well, on the show, and, but I'm very worried about, you know, the, the Matrix happening, like in real life. And Terminator, can we, we've had some prophets in the past that said, be very careful, this is dangerous technology. <laughs> well, some of the interesting parts about that is, like, when you look at the, the early... Um, the very early stages of AI training, the AI kind of acts like it's dreaming. It almost acts like a dream world. Yeah. Um, especially like um, if you play around with um, AI Dungeon or um, Dolly, when they were the image generator, when they were doing it at first, you go, man, some of this stuff is just like, it's like dreaming or like tripping or something. Very you know, bizarre. It's, yeah. It, 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 um, it sort of resembles clocks. human thought, but it doesn't, <laughs> there's no, that logical consistency is missing that the jump cuts are there. All that strange stuff is, is present. So yeah, this, this idea of neural networks of trying to um, get a machine to think like a human. It's interesting that the early processes of it resemble dreaming that, that, yeah. You know, and I think that that goes back to that that sort of primal or primitive way of of processing information. Absolutely. And there's a bit of a human hubris in there as well from the position of what makes you think you know how humans think to program mm. another entity or thing, machine to do what you don't really understand. I, I don't know. I'm not so sure. Yeah, like we just, yeah, like we just talked about, the history of psychology is just a patchwork of of theories um, that has changed drastically over the past 20 years. And yeah. we're still not sure that what we have is correct. Um, you know, neuroscience and biology, those are um, much more established sciences, but even neuroscience, there's, it's very um, isolated. You know, they look at the yeah. functions of specific cells, specific neurons, rather than holistically how, the being operates. So yeah, it, it is human hubris to look at the human machine. I won't even say the human brain, the human machine and say, yeah, we know how that works. Let's teach a machine how to do it. How to imitate no, us. We, yeah, yeah. we have no idea how we work. Yeah, and this, yeah. I want to give due respect to all those, those, those branches. And I think their research is, is entirely valid. And, and the conclusions they come up with in a limited frame is, you know, it's good, it's good science. It doesn't always extrapolate well to explaining other things. So we're like, well, we're looking at this cog and we can measure the diameter of the wheels and how fast it turns. And we've done an experiment. We have results. Yeah. But how does it fit in the machine? And what does it do? Why is it there turning like that? And how does it influence the other stuff? Well, we don't know yet. I mean, we're getting there. I'm not, I'm not dogging on yeah, it. I'm not knowing yeah. everything yet. We've been a long road. Well, the, most recent, <laughs> um, the most recent analogy I saw made by a neuroscientist was that Right now, it's like looking at the hands of a clock and saying that you know how the clock works. Yeah, no, we're that, about that, that far is away. Much I it. Think. We can observe that. We can observe the human. We can see what it does, um, and we can even observe some of the machinery. But we don't really know exactly how it all integrates. And yeah. um, you know, and like you said, science is. I'm not a science denier. Obviously, says the guy <laughs> in a PhD program, right? right? It's science a process. Is and the, it's very important that the process is followed and mm -hmm. that the process, um, you know, helps us gain knowledge in a way that is unparalleled to any other method. So it's very important. It yeah. is legitimate when done correctly, but it's very important to also recognize the limitations of science and, and to realize that it's not going to answer all of our questions. There's always going to be questions that... Um, are not going to be answered by science and we're going to have to you know either come to rational situation rational conclusions or say just accept the fact that we'll never know you know and i'm i'm somebody yeah. that's very comfortable with with not knowing things i like the mystery so that's why i'm 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 a philosopher i'm into that sort of thing oh, because sure. <laughs> um whereas some people say you know well i don't i don't know what happens after i die and that scares me i go no, I like it. I think it's kind of cool. Yeah, I'm not I really worried about it. It's kind of cool that I don't know what happened before the Big Bang or what happens after I die, you know? Yeah, but, I've got my own theories and uh, we'll find out. It's like, I'm not in a rush to get there, but I'm not afraid that it's going to happen someday. Uh, and that's right. another philosophical question. A lot of the folks who are like, 
what do you mean if you couldn't live for a thousand years, you, you, you wouldn't want to? And I'm like, I don't think so. I think that's, you just you die of boredom eventually. There's only so many things you can experience and places you can go. The older we get to, the more categories of experience we start identifying. I, I don't know if you ever played um, mm -hmm. massively multiplayer online role-playing games, MMORPGs. Yeah. So back in the day, I was a, I played EverQuest for five years back in 99 to mm -hmm. 2004. <laughs> I was a, I was an online gamer, man. I realized there were only three types of quests. And once you understood that, it kind of ruined the game. Everything was, you know, once you take the story out of it, run over here and deliver a package, go kill X number of things or go collect X number of things. So travel, kill, collect. And it's the same repetition. After that, I was just like, I don't need to play this game anymore. It's the same. Everything. They just put new words and pictures on the process. I think you live for a thousand years. You're going to get into that same thing where like, now you're just bored, so bored. And then people get into extreme yeah. things and hurting others. And I don't know. Yeah. I just wrote a paper. Um, I just finished it yesterday, a research paper on, um, gerontology, mm. which is, um, you know, the study of, of aged people. Wizards. And, um, <laughs> what's happening in that field is, um, you know, they're, they're identifying that really what makes people old, there's a lot of interesting studies coming out, right? They just did one on metabolism and they found that your metabolism doesn't slow down until you reach 60. Mm. So technically, you know, somebody could stay in the same amount of shape um, from 20 to 60 years old. Or that um, your mental faculties, um, your, you know, some of your sort of plastic working knowledge decreases a little bit. But your crystalline knowledge, your ability to retain facts and things actually increases throughout your life. Mm. And so looking at these things... And saying, well, you know, when you put all these pieces together, it doesn't seem like people should be as old as they are. What's causing this? And what they've sort of stumbled upon is this idea of accumulation, which is just saying that the experiences of life and the things, whether it's physical, emotional, psychological, whatever the case may be, as you go through life, you just start to collect baggage, right? Mm. And so regardless of the fact that your body and your mind and these sorts of things can, you know, technically keep up throughout life. Um, the, the things that you experience and the ways that those things affect you and they, the way they integrate with all of your prior experiences coupled with, um, the people that, you know, dying, right. You, you gradually become yeah. more and more alone, right. All of these things just sort of add up and they accumulate. Um, and that's, they think that that's really what causes old age. It's not, it's not one particular physical thing or psychological thing. It's just sort of everything, you know, going on and on. And if you think about it that way, you go, yeah, you, you get to that age, you get to be 80 or 90 and you, and you say, you know, what, uh, what am I doing here? You know, what, what, yeah. what's coming? I'm next, tired, you know, get it over with. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to imagine it at my age that, that happening. Right. Because even though, um, you know, I'm 34. So it's like, I, I still feel pretty childish in the sense that everything is interesting to me. Everything is interesting. Everything's new. I, I always like studying new stuff and meeting new people and doing these things. Yeah. Um, but, but I'm getting, I'm getting up there, right. At some point <laughs> it's going to be, Oh, well, you know, it's just, it, it, it's all adding up, you know? I think it's but. probably you're going to find a, a more consistent personality trait across time. You'll probably a very uh, be a very inquisitive 80 year old at some point of like, uh, you know, the the things you think about and find fascinating will probably change and you won't think of as many all at once. But that's I, I, I get the impression or if I understand it correctly, that certain traits like being naturally curious it's not, it's almost not something you can develop in someone. It's kind of a stable personality trait that exists over the lifetime. So I don't, you know, just in your case, uh, um, I'll probably still be a, um, disagreeable, cranky, uh, but friendly, you know, lovable asshole. <laughs> you'll, you'll probably be a, you know, people will go, he's got such youthful energy. He's so curious about things. <laughs> I bet that'll, they'll still say that so. about you. Um, well, Speaking of time and 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 uh, the duration of things, we are having so much fun talking. We forgot we were going to do a dream, and we're already an hour in. <laughs> you have time to we'll fit it in. We'll we'll do the thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good deal. Let me just write this down. Here we got one. Benjamin the Dream Wizard wants to help you pierce the veil of night and shine the light of understanding upon the mystery of dreams. 
Every episode of his Dreamscapes program features real dreamers gifted with rare insight into their nocturnal visions. New Dreamscapes episodes appear every week on YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, and other video hosting platforms, as well as free audiobooks highlighting the psychological principles which inform our dream experience and much, much more. To join the wizard as a guest, reach out across more than a dozen social media platforms and through the contact page at BenjaminTheDreamWizard.com, where you will also find the wizard's growing catalog of historical dream literature, available on Amazon, featuring the wisdom and wonder of exploration into the world of dreams over the past 2,000 years. That's Benjamin the Dream Wizard on YouTube and at BenjaminTheDreamWizard.com. How about that? 109. Okay, yeah, so as per just, my... It's just been a lot of fun talking about it, you know? Oh, yeah. You know, and I would... Um, if I were a better... If I were more confident in my interview skills, I might actually do that and just talk to people. But kind of the dream is... It's the draw of the show. It's the unique thing that I do. It's the mystery to solve together. I get to play, you know, Sherlock Holmes or Dr. House-ish, uh, which is great. I love I love it when I've discovered that, oh God, it's just a modern Sherlock Holmes uh, in the medical setting. That's great. Um, wow, lost my train of thought. Anyway, I love doing this. So um, I wouldn't want to give it up for just an interview show of like, you know, but um, then again, I always have to be careful of not eating up people's time too much to where like, you know, we got an hour, we can, we're going to get around to the dream thing or not. So <laughs> right, um, right. yeah, well, as per my uh, usual process, I'm going to shut up and listen. A friend's going to Tell us the dream, uh, beginning to end, whatever you remember, or write it out. We'll go through it again, a bit of a deep dive, and then uh, put together something that makes sense for you. So I'm ready when you are. Okay. All right. So um, the particular dream I'll tell you today, I had, I had a hard time narrowing it down. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, I remember <laughs> so many of them. But um, this specific one is one of two dreams that is reoccurring for me. So I've, I haven't kept track of how many times I've had it but I, I'd say it's upward of a dozen. Um, usually it'll happen every six months, every year, um, somewhere in that span. Six, six to 12 months, it'll, it'll pop up. Um, and it, it goes something like this. I usually start, I'm in like a, a Model T or something, like an old car that is, doesn't have a top. So, you know, it's, it's open to the elements. And um, I'm on like a cobblestone road and the road is just there's no buildings around it's just in an open field and it's a really nice day out um i don't have any sense of what the temperature is um but the sky is blue you know there's very few clouds but the ones that are there are white and puffy the sun's shining um the grass is nice and green um and I'm pulling up to a low stone wall. It's very well maintained. And there's a big, ornate, wrought iron gate in the wall. And the gate's open. So I drive the car through. And as I'm driving on this cobblestone road, there's just headstones, as far as the eye can see, in every direction. Um, and they're all uniform, um, just kind of a normal, um, you know, rounded on top headstone, nice even rows. It reminds you of looking at like um, Arlington Cemetery or something, mm. except instead of the crosses, it's just regular gravestones. And it's just all over. The, the terrain, like I said, is just these big rolling hills. And so as I'm driving, I can see rolling hill upon rolling hill upon rolling hill of, of these headstones. And I usually drive on this, you know, really well-maintained cobblestone road for about 10 minutes or so. And then I, on my left-hand side, um, about 100 feet away, there's a, a mansion. And it's pretty nondescript. Um, it's only two stories tall. And... It appears to be made out of stone, just kind of a, a white building. It's got some columns and things. And the only variation to this dream is that sometimes the front door to the mansion is open and sometimes it's closed. 
But regardless, I never go inside. Um, what happens instead is to the right of the mansion, there's a nine story tall stone tower. And the tower is also very nondescript. It's just a stone thing. And I get out of the car and I go into the tower and the tower is completely bare on the inside. It's just these rough wooden um, rafters with a stone structure. And I climb up the stairs all the way to the top story of the tower. And I look out the window. And when I look out the window from above, the mansion is no longer there. Mm. But I can see farther than I ever could. And it's still just graves as far as the eye can see. And after I get done looking out the window, I turn back into the stone tower. And suddenly I find the inside of the stone tower fascinating. Like, it's very interesting, right? But nothing has changed. All it is is just, you know, these big square blocks stacked on top of each other and these rough-hewn wood rafters. Um, and But I just, I get up close to them and I'm looking at the cracks in the stone and I'm looking at the splinters on the wood and going, oh, wow, this is really interesting. This is really neat. And then I wake up. Okay. There we go. What we got here? One fourteen fifty three. All right, lots of great detail there. So the beginning of the dream up to the approach to the mansion, or or it is the entire sequence, except for sometimes the doors open or closed. Um I guess what I'm trying to ask is, is this a rough sketch of an aggregate of all, say, 12 instances of the dream? Here's what usually happens. Or were there sometimes discrete changes along the way? The headstones are a different color. There's the, the path down the road takes five minutes instead of 10 minutes. Is it always kind of the same pattern, this precise thing? Yes, it's always the same. Okay. Um, and that's what's interesting about it is that telling you it, I can visualize it perfectly. Um, it's hard to explain. Like, I always start out at the same spot. So I'm in the car and I'm in front of the gate, but like the street doesn't approach the gate head on. It approaches it at an angle. So I'm sort of driving along the stone wall and then I turn into the gate. Um, so really all the way from beginning to end, um, it, if it must be very, very close to the same every time because I can visualize all of it gotcha. so vividly. It's a bit of a new experience for me. Uh, it is and it isn't. I've uh, dealt with many, many recurring dreams, but there's a surprising and unique, I think, uniformity, similarity to. This, 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 it is like literally the same sequence of events. Um, that, that has happened before. I talked to one guy who's, uh, you know, says there's very few deviations. It's always the same pattern. So there's something about the pattern itself, um, that seems relevant more than, more than, um, well, in addition to the con concept, sometimes you, you get a concept going and then you play with the details a little bit. You move things around mm -hmm. within an idea to try and get a different look at it. But this is trying to understand a, a recurrent pattern that you've noticed somewhere in you, yeah. in your behavior, so in your environment. There's something, something going on there. Yeah. And that's, what's interesting is because um, I made mention of the temperature because I live in Western New York, right? So we're, we're about to get six to 10 inches of snow. A chilly. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> but during the summer it's 90 degrees. So I'm used to a day like the day in the dream where the sun is shining and the sky is blue and the clouds are puffy and the, the grass is green, that doesn't really tell me anything about what time of year it is. Because we have days yeah. like that in summer where it's 95 degrees, but we have days like that in February, um, what we did a couple days ago, where it's, you know, 26. So the fact that I don't have any sense of temperature sort of throws me off in the dream because I don't know how to perceive this day. But, you know, the sun is always over the same hill. Um, you know, the gate's always in the same spot. It always looks the same. 
to to my knowledge, everything remains the same except for the door to the mansion. And for the first, I'd say half a dozen times in the dream, the door was always closed. Oh, and so then, the opening is now a kind of a recent change. Yeah. So in the last, you know, like I said, if 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 I've had the dream twelve times, which I'm guessing is about right, it's probably, you know, twelve to to fifteen times. The first six times, the door was always closed. And then since then, it's been sort of erratic, whether it's open or closed. Okay. Well, that's what we're going to do a little bit here is start going through this a bit. <coughs> deep dive, deep dive section. So you're in... Some kind of an older car. I mean, the idea of a Model T comes along. Does it feel, I mean, what am I trying to say? You have put yourself in a vehicle that is kind of iconic of the 1920s, 10s, early yeah, 20th yeah, century. Yeah, car, you know, it's, I say Model T because, you know, it's black. And so back in the day, they didn't make any other colors of cars. It's just this black open-topped vehicle. Uh, another thing that's, strikes me as strange about is that it doesn't make any noise there's no noise in the dream there's no oh, sound yeah um so as i'm driving through it's everything is in is complete silence and there's no people in the dream so as a result the entire thing is quiet and there's no perception of um temperature and those two things are what are really the two elements that stick out to me as as being strange because everything else is so vivid but Okay. And yeah, actually that is, that is be, because it is so prominent enough to stand out to you to say that was very strange. And I sure noticed it. I would say there's probably something in there in the realm of absent sensory experience, lack of input, something there. I'm not, I'm not, um, a lot of what I'm doing is throwing, throwing, you know, water and coffee and then we're gonna we're gonna let these things percolate but there's something in there about why you've got visual you got visual stuff going on and that's it's a very visual dream in in, in all the elements you're not hearing the car you know it's complete silence and though the sun is shining you're not feeling the warmth so there's mm. a relevance to the missing elements um this is something you have to see and can't be told maybe in a way like you're not getting that's that's a stretch maybe but but that that's where i'm going with this kind of stuff of like there's something about you can't just hear about this there's something about the visual medium that or the, or shutting out auditory input that's necessary to the process so i'm in there i don't want to say too much that's yeah the more i start yeah an interesting tidbit about me is um that i actually i don't have any sense of smell oh um so you're not gonna have any smell dreams yeah no. <laughs> yeah. As a matter of fact, the only time I could smell was when I got COVID. Um, and obviously it wasn't a real smell, but um, I was perceiving the smell of coffee brewing all the time for about six days and wow. then it went away. But yeah, I could smell um, up until the point I was about a teenager and then it went away completely. Um, but yeah, the, the idea of um, having a absent sense is not all that foreign to me, but hearing is one that I... I do have. Yeah. So it could be analogous to, to something. Imagine other senses were missing. It doesn't seem like, um, you didn't have the experience of feeling numb. There's a different quality to that, but there's something about selectively choosing the frame through which to view something. I mean, view is a metaphorical sense of like, sometimes you close your eyes so you can hear better. And sometimes you, um, you know, put on say, uh, uh, noise dampening headphones or go to a quiet place so you can study and focus. There's something about um, maybe that kind of idea going on there where there's the, this, this absence is relevant to, so that's just the impression I get. So very strange thing you had going on with the COVID deals. Like a lot of people lost their sense of smell while they had COVID and you got it back yeah. temporarily. What is that connection with the nose and how it hits the brain? I yeah, have no it idea. Is, it's strange. Yeah. But yeah. The dream, um, I, yeah, I always, the, my, the feeling that I have in the dream is always very happy and peaceful. Okay. Which yeah. struck me as strange the first couple of times I had it because, you know, I, I think that when I woke up the first couple of times I had it, my instinct was to say, well, I'm driving through this graveyard. Like it should be 
a somber or sort of depressing or even creepy experience. Um, but in the dream, it's always very cool, and I always am very um, happy or up or even kind of tempted. Yeah. Driving. You know, it's right. um, and everything in the dream is very well maintained. You know, the stone wall, all the stones are of roughly proportional size. You know, the mortar's all intact. The right of wrought iron gate's nice. The cobblestone street is nice. The mansion and the stone tower are built very well, even though they're very plain. Um, the grass is cut. You know, the the tombstones are uniform. So everything's yeah. very nice. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's just so, strange. It seems like, you know, I, I remember feeling a little disconcerted the first couple times I woke up from it thinking, well, who has who has a happier or nice dream about a graveyard? You know, but, yeah. A, a ginormous graveyard stretching into the distance. Yeah. Um, if I were to get a mental image of trying to see it through your eyes, I don't know why. To me, this is just what my brain did as soon as you started describing it. You're driving. The in, in my head, this is what I see. The sun's on your right. You're driving along the wall on your left, and you get to the gate and go in. Is that actually... Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yep, I'm on the road. Complete guess. Sun is to the right. <laughs> gate. So sun's to the right, and the wall and the gate are to the right initially. That's where I start the dream, but immediately I drive through the gate, and then the wall is on the left the remainder of the dream. Gotcha. So you're actually turning towards the sun. Yeah. Where the sun? Yeah, okay. so that, yeah, the road, yeah, the road goes at an angle to the wall, and so I start outside the wall and the gate. I drive through immediately. That's the first thing that happens in the dream. And then as I'm driving, the sun stays on my right. Um, the wall goes farther and farther behind until by the time I get to the mansion and the stone tower, the wall isn't even in sight anymore. Okay. So we've definitely got a representation of a uh, boundary there. Um, there is the world outside this area and then there is entering through the gate where this other area exists so that uh, i don't want to i don't want to give it any more characterization than that but it's it's definitely crossing a threshold into entering a place versus i was on a lonely country road and there's a graveyard over there you know it's mm. it's it's a walled area there's an encapsulated idea in this place um it's also very as you were saying, it's happy and peaceful. So the, the, the mood in the dreams, and I always forget to bad. Well, how did you feel? What did you think about that? I gotta, I gotta get better at that too. Give me, give me another hundred dreams. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm glad people volunteer it too, because it could have been a very different experience of like you were dreading going in there. So there's something mm. almost reverential about, about this. It's, um, it's, a uh, it's not, it's not a celebration, but it's, it's like, it's, it's not, sad what am i trying to say of course it's it's happy it's uh peaceful. yeah well and then another interesting part yeah. about this is that so the first time i had this dream um you know it would have to have been in my early 20s and at that point in my life um nobody really close to me had died yet all my mm -hmm. grandparents lived into their late 90s um and so i hadn't really known anybody that had died yet and yet i was in this graveyard um so that seemed kind of strange to me too yeah um at the time since that time all my grandparents have died and my dad um as well as some other people that i've been close to but that's never changed the um the character of the dream how i feel in it it's always calm it's always peaceful yeah um and there's no specific graves that stick out i'm not traveling to anybody's grave i'm not seeing any writing on any graves there's just a sea of headstones as it, as far as you can see yeah, that's one thing I was going to mention is, and that's kind of where I was going with it too, is like, this wasn't a small cemetery with your relatives' graves and it was dark and it was creepy and you were sad. This is a different conception of death. And I don't even know that it's death. In in a sense, it's like we, what is it? Uh, more people are dead now than are currently alive throughout mm -hmm. history. If something like that's like, yeah. we, we are, yep. we are living in a world where most of the people who ever lived are dead and we're kind of traveling through a world they left behind. I think there's something mm -hmm. in there that you've 
some way of conceptualizing your something something tells me it's like uh um what am, what am i getting i do feel Go i ahead. feel like that's relevant because there is something about it that seems ancient kind of you know i i think that it's hard to put my finger on it but i think that in the dream, especially at the end when I'm in the top of the tower overlooking everything, I think there's there's something in my mind that says it took a long time for this many people to fill this graveyard. You know, this wasn't something that sprung up overnight or over oh, decades yeah. or even centuries. It seems like whatever is here has has been here for a very long time. And I think that, you know, that the stone tower kind of feels the same way the, the construction of it is this sort of thing that um it's very sturdy it's very rough and it seems very old you know there's there's no frills to it there's no facade to it it's just this um sort of monolithic old thing you know? yeah yeah definitely that's kind of where i was going with it too the idea of um and that the idea that it takes you a long you got to go a long way. It takes 10 minutes driving to get through rolling hills um, to get where you're going. So there's a, I'm going to worry at this bone a little bit. It's we've got a representation. That's why I said it's uh, not respectful. What did I say? But reverential. It's like you're, you're imagining the, the, the beauty in a way that all these people have lived and that you are alive too. But mm. not just that. Uh, the, there's something like reverential, like a privilege, like it's a privilege to mm, have to be passing through where all these other people were. It's, that's not right. Cause it, this is, is not an abandoned city. It's, it's past evidence that they existed and it's, mm. it's a, it, there's, it's a thing of beauty. That's why I go with that reverential theme. It is, it's not meant to be scary, creepy, disgusting. It's not, it's not the, the horror of the body falling apart in death. It's, it's, um, and that's why celebration doesn't seem like the right word, but reverence for. Yeah. I think reverential life. is a very good term. And I yeah. almost feel like that's, that's part of the reason that the audio is missing. Right. Because I feel like if I could hear the, the wooden wheels of the car on the cobblestone or birds I singing or something it, yeah. else. I feel like that would take away from the actual experience of the dream a little bit. I feel like that, that absence of sound and just being able to, to look, you know, around myself as I'm driving, because I'm not really driving the car, right? I'm not paying any attention to driving the car. The car is just moving. Yeah, and you're I, not operating while the wheel it's moving, or anything, I'm looking yeah. around at the sun, at the hills, at the gravestones, at the wall, you know? Um, yeah, there is something, it, it's almost this intense, um, just this hyper um, being in the moment, you know, I, I'm very in the moment as I'm traveling through this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, that's why I'm, um, I got a couple of ideas that I, I think the theme might be leading to, but I, I want to, it's always hard to, well, it's variably difficult in different circumstances and in different mental capacities for me and different people, but to not, lead you somewhere, but to hold on loosely onto an idea that I think that might be where we're going. And so I don't want to start saying too much about that because then I can color the whole rest of the perceptions. But if we get there, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so we may, we may let this segment. So we have kind of a few distinct segments, even though they all blend together, there's the approach and the crossing of the boundary. There's the necessity of passing through the evidence of people that came before you in, in a way that feels reverential and, and bright and sunny and orderly and, and uh, uniform in that sense. Like a, there's a commonality to all these expressions of uh, like everyone was given the same respect in death and the person mm -hmm. who buried them cared to put them in a nice neat line. This, that's why, that's why I keep getting that, that idea of reverential uh, uh, reverence. Um, and it's not, flat it's rolling it's rolling hill so it kind of works with like uh there's there's a natural flow to the landscape in a way that uh makes it seem even more right in a sense yeah, like the rolling because, hills feel right for the circumstance yeah and you know it's when i was mentioning how everything seems very 
um, kind of perfect or picturesque. The hills are much the same because it almost seems like all of the hills, the size, the shape, the height are all pretty uniform as well. Um, there's no hills that are towering above other ones uh. or there's no hilltops that aren't perfectly round. You know, they, they're just slightly offset. So you have one, then you have another, and then you see one in the back, but they're all roughly, um, roughly the same size and shape and height. And it just seems very, um, very nice. I don't know. Definitely. Yeah. And there's, there's some of that feeling too, where you go and you mentioned what, like Arlington, uh, cemetery, the idea that it is a beautiful visual display, even though you're looking at where people died, you also have that respect for what they did in life that led them to have a place of honor in that way. Um, and this seems, this seems something like a place of honor. Cause we've got two, we've got, everything is well maintained, it's cared for. In, you know, it, which is very much the opposite of falling apart, actively falling apart. Even the things that are old are so sturdy. They're still there. Even if they're showing signs of weather and age, uh, they're still standing. And there's something, something about the inherent value of something that's, that's just crafted well to endure. Um, and that goes for, you know, physical objects. And I think meta metaphorically for, for ideas that are worth, exploring There's something solid and valid about an idea that uh, it endures over time um, it may or may not be where, where we're heading in that, in that metaphysical sense, but um, did anything happen? Well, did you have any sense of yourself at what you were wearing um, and, and any, any movements or anything you were doing? I mean, you're looking around, you're kind of seeing things and a lot of people don't, it's like first person shooter. You're looking out of your own eyes. You don't really see your feet, that kind of thing. Um, any, any sense of yourself? Yeah, no, not really. Um, I can't think of, I think that if I knew what I was wearing, it would help me clue, clue me into the temperature a little bit. Sure. Um, and I think that's part of the thing that drives me crazy is that it, you know, I, I never look down to see what I'm wearing. So I don't know what the temperature is like outside. And like I said, the car seems to be driving itself um, so that I have the ability to look around and, and focus on other things while we're going. The only motion I ever make is at some point while we're driving, I reach forward and I pull a lever back. Mm. Um, but it doesn't seem to have any effect on anything that happens in the dream. So at some point, there's a lever on the side of the car that I pull back. N you know, nothing happens. There's no real... Um, you know, it's it's not something that I've ever paid much attention to in the past, yeah. but I know that it happens. And that element of the dream recurs as well. Like at some point you pull the lever and yeah. then the dream yeah. goes on. That one definitely, that that's, that's definitely a part of the dream that seems more vague that com contrasts with all the other vivid elements of it. You know, where it goes, I, you know, I go, yeah, I know I pull a lever and, you know, I'm reaching out like this, but. I don't know what color my sleeve is or if I'm wearing sleeves right? yeah. or, you know, what the lever looks like or anything. I just know that I reach out and pull a lever. That's, that's, that's why I follow these it. things in my, my intuitive sense too, because I, I didn't know you're going to tell me you had an experience of pulling a lever. I just asked, well, could, did you have a sense of yourself, anything you were wearing, that kind of thing. Um, and that brought that out as I, and it's interesting that it doesn't seem to have any precipitating cause no, no, nothing occurs which you go oh it is lever time and nor does it seem to have any kind of effect that's interesting too no cause or effect from but you're and yet you're taking an action so you're taking an action that has no reason for it and accomplishes nothing and you're not even really driving you're kind of being shown you're being shown something you're showing yourself something and in a sense letting yourself also know that in some ways, you're just along for the ride. You're not even making any of this happen. It's, there's something in there. It's one of those things we just kind of, I just kind of say it. And then we don't have to have an answer right away, but it might add up to something later. Very interesting. Yeah. Unless you have an yeah, impression. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I know that I, the only other detail I have about the leather lever is that I know I'm pulling it as I'm going down a side of the hill. So it's always, I, I come up, I'm cresting a hill as I'm going down, I reach out, I pull the lever, and then I just continue driving. It's usually, um, I'd say it's about halfway through the drive. The wall is out of sight to the left, but the mansion and the tower have not yet come into view. 
That's good um, details too. Yeah, about about what you see and and the so there's a sequence of events. You've reached a point where the bound you've gone so far beyond you can no longer see the boundary anymore. You're well into this thing, whatever it is, but you haven't reached the center yet. You're still on the journey towards what it is you're trying to reach, and there's some some expression of feeling feeling like you need to take action. Like there's something you need to do to justify yourself being there or, or it's not, that's not the right word. Maybe it is, maybe it is not, but it's not justifying your presence. It's actively contributing, whether it seems like going through the motions or not. Yeah. The, I think the, mind? the general feeling around, around it is that, um, you know, okay. I, the car is driving itself. I'm looking around at, at the graves and at the hills and at the sun and the clouds and stuff. I'm having a good time. And then it, it just suddenly occurs to me. It's not urgent, but also I go, oh, I should pull that lever. And I reach out and I pull it. And that's it. Yeah, there's kind of an uh, absent-minded it, realization. It feels like that it's something that I should have known or should have remembered to do. And I forgot I was distracted by the scenery. And then all of a sudden it occurs to me that, oh, I should pull that lever. And it's almost immediately after you pull the lever that you, the, the mansion comes into view. Um, yeah, I think it would be shortly thereafter. Um, okay. like I said, I'm usually going downhill when I do that. And then, um, you know, I, I, I never, I never see the mansion and tower from far off. Um, when I see them is when I, I look to the left and the the mansion is immediately to my left. So I I don't see it coming up. I don't see it approaching. (laughs) I'm driving and looking. And then when I look to my left, it's there. The mansion is suddenly, Ooh, froggy. Yeah, it's suddenly there. Um, And then again, as far as more details go, it's really, it has a flat roof like there's no pitch to any of the roof um it has you know two stories and there's regularly placed windows along it but the windows are are very tall but they're so narrow that i can't see inside anything inside and um the door is the same color as as the rest of the mansion it's just this white and Mm -hmm. sometimes it's open sometimes it's not um it looks as if you know, the around the windows, the window sills, the window ledges and those sorts of things, as if there might have been some sort of ornate carving or facade to them in the past. Um, but I'm either too far away or they've become too weathered that I, I can't make anything out. And the thing that's interesting about the tower is that I, I can't see the door of the tower from the car. And so I never remember how I get inside. Mm. I see the tower, I get out of the car, I start walking towards it. And then the next thing I know, I'm on the ground floor of the tower and I'm walking up the stairs. Okay. So about, so there's something about a, the destination may be the wrong word that comes, it comes upon you suddenly. There is something in there. Uh, the idea of it isn't, it isn't like you were running down this road and you suddenly caught sight of the man in, mansion in the distance. And thank God my I'm tired. I want to get there already. And so there's a sense of relief or anything. It's more like it surprises you that yeah. it's suddenly you've, gone far enough you've seen enough you've, you've you've put enough you've gone enough distance there's there's a variety of ways of looking at this in terms of um made enough progress ad, um, advanced towards something there's there's an approach <clears throat> metaphor in there you got to reach you got to get somewhere and then the somewhere it, you, you you know um i don't think anywhere in this dream yeah. you go ahead i'll help you out again with some more of my, my feelings in it. Yeah. Yeah. So usually when I look to the left and I see the mansion in the tower, um, 
they're there suddenly, but I'm not surprised. So I go, okay, there they are. I get out, and my feeling is always that I'm going to go into the tower, and then after I'm done in the tower, I'm going to go into the mansion. But I never make it that far. I always wake up first. So I go, okay, "Okay, I'm going to check out this tower first, and then I'm going to go in the mansion, and then I'm going to continue on my trip. The road continues to go on you know, well past the mansion. It just continues on indefinitely as far as I can tell. And so in the dream, it feels like I'm just making a quick stop, right? I go, oh, hey, hey, here's some buildings. Here's some stuff that is new. I'm going to get out. I'm going to check out this tower. I'm going to check out this mansion. I'm going to get back in the car and I'm going to keep driving. But I just never, I never make it that far. So it's not actually, say, like the dead center destination. It's more of a happenstance you can yeah, cross and what a I, thing. I always tell myself is that, you know, oh man, six months or a year from now when I have the dream, I'm just going to be screaming to myself in the dream to check out the mansion first. Go in the door. You it's know, open. To try to go in there first, but I, I never can. I never yeah. remember. <clears throat> For sure. Um, that, that was going to be a question I had too. Does the road continue on or it was this like um, it ends in a cul-de-sac or something? This is This is the place. There's nowhere else to go. Um, apparently there's more to see your journey is not over technically, or, and that's also the feeling you're getting from, this is a stop along the roadside. I'm going to check this out. Cause it's interesting. Did you have that feeling of, you definitely had the feeling of wanting to see what was inside the tower. And also there was a plan to, okay, when the tower is done, I'll go look in the house or the mansion. Um, yeah. Yeah. In my waking life, I like to do, um, urban exploring, right? I like to find abandoned places and, and look through them. So it, it kind of felt the same in the dream. I pulled up, I go, well, there's obviously nobody around. And these two buildings are kind of interesting. And they're, they're almost kind of very opposite from each other. One's very tall and thin. And the other one's kind of short and, you know, expansive. And um, yeah, I just want to, I just kind of want to look around and see, you know, what are they doing way out here in the middle of a graveyard and what's inside? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's interesting that you didn't choose to go into the mansion first. It was even, it was closer. It was immediately to yeah, the left and the yeah, tower's so, actually further yeah, away. The mansion's on the left and, and the, uh, the tower's on the right. So I, I drive past the mansion to, um, I park the car on the road and, and the mansion and the tower are about a hundred feet, I'd say off the road. So I parked the car on the road and then I walk to the tower and as i'm walking to the tower i think yeah i'm going to check out that mansion next yeah um, so you were definitely drawn to that first then there's okay so this is where i, where I pull up a couple of, so, of associations that you tell me if they they seem right there's mansion is wealth fame fortune etc towers are more associated with ascending uh high places learning spiritual matters in some ways now this isn't like dream book style of but uh this is Broad human associations. I mean, if we look at a um, um, well, a mansion, what does it make you think? I mean, it's a mansion, so it's a place where wealthy people live. Uh, uh, it, it, so, it might represent riches or material gain in a way that a tower is more associated with. Um, you know, as I said, climbing, climbing the heights, academia specifically. Um, when you think about it, those symbolic references in that kind of way, does anything come to mind about your choices in regarding what interests you most, or? why you would choose one first and then the other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, I've always been somebody, you know, obviously interested in in education Um, and not just formal education. I'm working on my PhD, but really the only reason I'm working on my PhD is because I was in the army. And so it's very cheap. I don't have any student loans or anything. I just, I basically go to school for fun. I've got a job that pays me much more than anything with a PhD in psychology would pay (laughs) me. So I'm probably not going to get a job as a result of it. It's just very interesting to me. So I keep going. Um, And I've, I've always been that way um, throughout life. Just, just very interested in learning and stuff. Um, And money has never really been very important to me. Um, my podcast has gotten big enough where I, I have opportunities to monetize it. I don't, so I, I don't run any commercials. I don't, I don't, I don't sell any products or anything. Um, yeah, I don't really have any social media following. You know, I, I don't, I don't really, um, same thing with my music. I don't really advertise or, or go after monetizing things. I more, um, I more do things for the experience of doing them. 
and then um i share them with with the world if people want to um partake in them but i've never really um i've never really marketed anything um so yeah that's that's would kind of be the association that i'd have with the, the two concepts of of um sort of wealth versus um uh, achievement maybe um i i do consider myself very achievement driven i i like to take on projects and um you know, I, I I like to get involved in a wide variety of things and kind of master concepts and then move on to new things. Mm -hmm. um, but usually there isn't a monetary um, element to them. Fair enough. Yeah. No, and that's kind of what I was thinking back in the beginning. You, you seem like I was, we were talking about naturally curious type of guy. And that doesn't mean you wouldn't have a focus on, um, you know, meeting life's necessities of, you know, having a place to live and food on the table and, you know, money's not unimportant, but it doesn't seem to be, you're not chasing fame and fortune for their own sake. Uh, if those things happen incidentally, fine. Um, that might be one kind of way to uh, think of how the, why the mansion kind of in a way suddenly appears like, Oh, there it is. But it wasn't very interesting. It's like, that's not, that's not the place I think is, most worth exploring first uh like it's you, you you didn't there was no absence of mansion the mansion's there and it's there it's it's actually easier to reach perhaps than the tower you have to go further to get to the tower you got to climb to the top of the tower it's not as it's, it's more difficulty involved in the tower but at least you know the 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 concept of the mansion is kind of in place and it's um it also has the impression of being very old and once very I don't know if you said ornate or anything, but that it is in a bit that it had a past glory to it that is now a yeah. little faded, but it's still sturdy. It doesn't look like it's falling apart. No. Yeah. I don't think I want to jump on any further down, down that idea either. Just, just those ideas. Like it's a, it's not a place without value. It's not a place you pass up because it's so fallen apart. You think it's dangerous or it's looks you know, like those, um, big old houses and scary movies. You're like, I'm not going in there. No, but that doesn't look like a yeah. place I want to go. Yeah. This actually is maybe a nice place you wouldn't mind going into. And it has a history to it as a past glory. It's still sturdy. Um, but I'll, I'll stop there. You were going to say something. Yeah, no, it just, um, it has the, the feeling looking at it, um, that it's just nice enough, but it's also just worn enough that, it, it's sort of uncertain whether anybody has been living there or keeping it up. You know, gotcha. it could go either way. Maybe somebody, maybe somebody lives there um, and it's just a very old place or maybe it's been abandoned, but recently it's, it's, it's very hard to tell yeah. by looking at it. Um, if it's been, if it is currently inhabited or not. But. Yeah. I think it is conceptually impersonal in the same way driving through the graveyard is there's something to that idea. There's a, there's a consistency of that kind of experience through the dream. Um, it's definitely in a relative state of disrepair compared to the rest of it, like the manicured lawn and the headstones like that all has a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that has a bit more value importance to it in a way like that seems right. And this place I don't know that it doesn't seem wrong necessarily, but it seems right that it is the way it is, which is slightly mm -hmm. tarnished. I, what I think of is um, things that were once considered to be very valuable and now, eh, you know, it, it's not worthless, but it's just not what it was or doesn't. It's something maybe that other people would value, but when you look at it, it's not as pretty. There's some visual representation of, of value in terms of what's important going on in, in, in the way you choose to, or have chosen or have showed yourself things are constructed. Then again, we've got the tower and the tower is in a similar state of, or how would you compare the, you know, yeah. So yeah, go ahead. The, the, the tower, um, the way I describe the tower is the tower is not fancy, but I, I don't think that it ever was. Um, and so as a result, it's almost kind of hard to tell if it's worn or not, because 
if you imagine like um like a castle turret you know yeah that's kind of what it looks like it's just this just this stone structure just stone on top of stone and when you walk inside there's just these big wooden rafters that are holding up the ceiling um but it's almost kind of ageless you know it's hard you can't tell by looking at it from the outside or the inside um whether it was built you know 10 days ago or 10,000 years ago it's just you know it is what it is it's this um sort of plain sturdily built structure but you know, it, it, it's impossible to tell whether it's worn like the mansion is or not. Yeah, it's got kind of a <clears throat> almost a timeless, ageless quality to it. It's, it seems very old, but you, no way to tell how old because it was so well done. Um, it's kind of a an expression of an, an inherent value in there that's a little different than the mansion, which lost some of its value from losing a bit of its exterior luster. There's something something mm-hmm. going on in that representation. So without without dwelling too much, um, I wanted to get a sense of those things. And there was no actual experience of how you get inside the tower. No door found below. Right. Um, when I get out of the car and I'm approaching the tower, I don't remember ever seeing a door on the first level. Um. And there is sort of, that's like the only real jump cut in the dream I can think of is I'm walking towards the tower and I glance over at the mansion. And then when I look back, I'm on the first floor of the tower and I still do not see any door. um, But also I don't look for it. So I'm in the center of the first floor of the tower and I'm looking at the first stairs that go up to the second story but I don't look behind me. I don't really look to either side to see if there was a door that I came through or not just in there. Okay. Yeah. That that is interesting though, too. So there's something about the way you're conceiving this, that, that needed you to not walk through a door to get inside there. You drove through a gate to get into the graveyard long rows, but this is a different kind of experience. You're, mysteriously transported inside. You're not, you're, even if there was a door behind you, eh, you just have no memory of it, so we could say it's not there. But certainly you have no memory of walking through it. No experience of entering a door, opening a door, yanking at an old heavy door, that kind of thing. Um, that's probably a unique kind of experience to the, to the type of place it is, that, that getting in is not, not easy. And... Mm. You might not yeah, really seems, understand um, how. Yeah. Yeah, it seems an inaccessible almost um until you're inside. And um I think once I'm inside the idea of my previous plans of going to explore the mansion and then driving on um they don't really exist anymore. Um from that point on I'm focused on getting up to the top of the tower and then looking out. And then after that, I'm focused on examining the inside of the tower. But the idea of leaving the tower again, it, it kind of leaves my mind and the dream ends before I get a chance to do anything else. So you climb, how many, um, I'm, I'm seeing like, uh, a wraparound staircase that has landings every now and again. So there's actual floors to it. Yeah. Yeah. So the way that it works is, um, against one edge of the tower, there's stone steps up to the landing. And then you walk to the opposite side and there's stone steps up to the next one. Oh, okay. So it keeps going. Gotcha. So it's more of a square tower. I I imagined a round one. I, I didn't even ask. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's, um, it's square. Gotcha. Okay. And nothing on each floor. It's pretty bare. No, no experience beyond kind of just eh, walking through and making your yeah. Continue yeah. As a matter of fact, I know that there's nothing in any of the tower. There's nothing at all. All there is is the stairs and the wooden rafters that hold up each each uh, floor of the the levels. But there's there's no furnishings. There's not a table. There's not a jar or anything. It's just 
But also it didn't seem like, you know, dirty or the, broken. The very top floor. But also it didn't seem me yeah, dirty or broken or um, cobwebs or. Um, no, no. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, even though there's no windows, it's very brightly lit on the inside. Um, there's no windows or light sources, but it, it's brightly lit. I don't have any problems seeing. There's nothing um, hiding. There's nothing um, that seems dirty or uncapped or anything. It's just there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No experience of windows and yet um, illuminated. There's there's mm. something there's something in here about. Well, it's not like secret knowledge, but maybe it is. It's more like the. I. Let's get up. Let's get up. To this. So you reach the top floor. Um, and that's where there is, so far as you can tell, only one window and it looks out. Yeah. Yep. There's just one window and it's, it's, it's a big window. It takes up almost the entire wall of the one side of the tower that's facing the mansion, which is also the way that I came from. Um, and so I walk up to that that window um like i said it takes up almost the whole wall except it's about waist high so um i just walk up and i look out um and it it doesn't occur to me that the mansion is no longer there like it doesn't seem strange or anything um i just don't see it from where i'm at, from where i am um and i look out and that's all there is is just the the hills and the the headstones and no different experience or or visual impression of what could be seen from there you see you saw what you expected to see in a way yes so um the hills and the headstones are much like i would expect them to look from that vantage point you know based off of my waking dreams the only things that seem strange from a waking viewpoint are that the mansion is no longer there and that the sun seems very bright. Okay. Yeah. There's something about the view, literally the view from this kind of place, whatever this place is, this perspective that has removed the mansion from your sight in that way and in, in such a way that it's only on reflection you go oh yeah it was gone i mean but in the dream at the moment you're not even missing it you just can't even see it there's some things or um what is that phenomenon where we it's right in front of us we can't see it uh for whatever reason i think that it might be something like that but there's no difference in the dream it's gone physically which sure it can be or you're looking right past it because it's no longer relevant uh it's not even in your field of view anymore um right yeah. I mean, there's a chance I'm trying to, you know, think of it nine stories up and, and the tower and the mansion are in very close proximity. So I would have to look quite a ways down in order to see it anyways. I might oh, yeah. just not be looking down. And That's possible. I'm yeah. looking out for the most part. Yeah, very much so. Well, you very uh, <clears throat> easily could have made the tower four stories tall and had the mansion still within your view. It's like by the time you get to the top, of this place, a place worth climbing, a place with a view you want to experience, the mansion will no longer be visible from from this place. It, it will have faded from your view. There's something about looking and, and, and the sight and climbing up high to get a, 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 a vantage point, a vista, um, that removes, I'd say, less important things from your notice and gives you the bigger picture further into the distance than you could see at ground level. It's very much something to this. That's, that's a lot of the climbing metaphors that people have in their dreams is something about getting up high that signifies, you know, achievement, attainment, climbing Mount Everest to, to style. Um, but also better understanding. We, we tend to think of, um, you know, our levels go up in video games and we level up with our, with our degrees in real life. Uh, there's, there's also connection with education, that regard of like towers being classically, um, I mean, part of a castle, but also, um, 
well, in, in, in the case of, of, of storytelling, like where a wizard lives and, you know, where, where arcane mm-hmm. knowledge is, is, so it's very much, there's, there's like a, I think this educational attainment is, is, is a theme running through this thing. And the, the idea of the people that have gone before, well, what, what you really value in life, um, and definitely with your military connection, the idea of, of a reverence for people that have gone before you and given their lives, perhaps you didn't get that sense though, that of any reason why the people had died. Um, then no. it wasn't actually an art Arlington style place. They weren't soldiers. No. Yeah, no. Um, I, I never got the sense that I would have known anybody that was there. Um, yeah, it was it was reverential, but also kind of abstract. There wasn't really any personal connection to it. Yeah, that's it. In, in a sense, that's how we we feel about a lot of the people we read of in books. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. their ideas survived, but I don't know the guy. I mean, he's been dead a long time. I don't have any uh, sudden sadness that he's no longer with us. I just read read his words from three hundred years ago. That kind of, there's something something in there along those lines. Um, and it is, there is something about taking in this view and having that experience where say the, um, pursuit of material gain is no longer even on your radar, so to speak, um, turns you back to examining the structure of the tower itself in fine detail. There's something there about a, have you thought about becoming teacher uh it's maybe not the right way to do it but like not not right way to say it not do it you do whatever you want of course um something about sharing information and if you in order to so there's a meta level of it's one thing to climb the tower it's another thing to understand the tower does that make Mm -hmm. sense yeah so um it's one of those things where when i'm climbing the tower um, I'm not really paying much attention to it. I'm just focused on getting to the top. Um, and then after I take in the view, it always seems strange to me after I wake up because it feels like after I wake up, the dream should end after I look at the view. Like, okay, well, that's the pinnacle of the dream. Right, is yeah. Looking at the view and then it should end. But it, it doesn't end there. It goes on with turning back to the tower and and really, you know, looking at the stones and wondering how they were cut and you know looking at the the wooden beams and wondering what kind of wood they are and you know and what they did with them and and i go back down the levels i don't make it all the way back down to the bottom but i know i at least make it down to like the seventh level i go nine eight seven and then each level and i'm looking just just looking at the the inside of the tower and again like i mentioned before there's there's nothing in it it's very bare um but something about it captures my interest and is seems very fascinating even though on the walk up i wasn't really paying much attention yeah and there's no sense of what the examination is for it's just captured your attention in a way that seems irresistible yeah Yeah. gotcha yeah as a as a full experience you are and this and this all kind of is again and it, it wants you to the dream wants you to start with the imagination that you're in a very old car no top on it this kind of 1920 style thing and that or early 1900s and that kind of sets the opening point of game okay, imagine you're this type of person in this type of place and here's this type of experience you're going to have here and it keeps coming back what is it about that? Do you have any special connection to that time period or those, those kind of old cars? Uh, what When you think of like an old Model T, I mean, what comes associatively comes to mind? Yeah, not really. Um, you know, they were never really my thing. Um, the only real experience I had with them is um, my grandpa's brother um, had a, a car museum where he had um, several large barns and two story and on each story he had um just dozens and dozens of these old cars um so we used to go there for family reunions and stuff um and they ended up it ended up burning down um there's they had a big fire and they all ended up burning down but um for the most part i don't really care for that style of car um i don't have any personal connection to it 
I think the important part in the dream is having the best view. So even mm. if I had a modern convertible, right, you're, you're sitting so low that it feels like the doors and the windshield and things would still be in your, your mm. viewpoint. Yeah. It seems important that in that style of car, the seat is at the very top of the vehicle. So 360 degrees, you can look in every direction and, and see what's actually there instead of trying to look around something or look through a windshield or something. Fair I enough. think that's the yeah. important part. Yeah, that may may very well be. Um, and I think, well, if that makes sense to you, uh, I think it probably is. I think it's also a little bit of imagining yourself as someone from another time is 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 uh, is part of it. There's um definitely human experience. It doesn't it doesn't changes, but there are modern times versus. And then, of course, in the early 1900s, they thought they were we, we were living in modern times, and they'd uh, uh, just ask any eugenicist, "We're going to uh, perfect the human race any day now through the miracle of science." Um, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, there's there's something about that where you're looking at it like imagine I'm even in a different time and place. I'm a, but also also yeah, the view. I mean, it. you could have had a very different. Kind of vehicle, but it was this particular kind of vehicle, and it went and uh, you did want to maximize the view. Very important element. I, you, that is a say- difficult. I think that is a difficult element of the dream. Is much like with the the temperature. Um, you know, I can look at everything around and have it be very vivid, but I don't have any idea what the temperature is. I feel like everything else in the dream is very similar for time period, right? Mm. When I look at the mansion and the tower, they don't have any specific architectural style um i never see my clothes really the car is the only thing in the dream that points to any type of time period anything else in the dream you know if the car could place it in 1920 but if you change the car the whole whole thing could easily been placed today or if it was in a you know a, a care you know a wagon it could have been 500 years ago yeah the structure of the 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 mansion and the tower and the graveyard and everything else, um, it's it's all kind of timeless outside of the car design. Yeah, there there is that theme of ancient things enduring, timeless quality to stuff, an endless, seemingly endless expanse where you have to cross a boundary to get into it. But once you're in there, you don't see that wall anymore. The wall disappears. Now it's just mm-hmm. graveyards forever. Um, related to then also the comparison of yourself to someone else from a well literally a hundred years ago uh, that's a there's some, sometimes there's a mm, not meaningful but humans latch on to things like increments of 10 and 100 so you might say well what was it like a hundred years ago or what what if i what if i was what if i compared myself to a person from that time because fundamentally our experiences are similar in some way even though we're separated by a hundred years I could very well be having this experience today or back then. So let's imagine it's back then. There's something about that of you're, you're viewing, you're viewing what well, we already kind of hit upon an idea of like you're viewing patterns over time. That's way too vague. It, it's, it's not. Um, trying to understand how th- some things repeat and why or Given that some things stay the same, there's the uh, um, death and taxes type type of thing. Like there's death all around. Someday you will join them. Um, you have the kind of basic representations of do I achieve piles of money or piles of knowledge in a way? You know, which which what's what's more important to me? You pick the the tower is the most important thing, and with the intent of exploring further, at least dabbling maybe in entering the experiencing the wealth or fame side of things maybe, but that gets lost completely in the fascination with the tower itself, with what it represents to you and understanding how it's made Mm. the elements of it in fine detail. Yeah. It has, has no right to be as interesting as it is. Yeah. But it just seems, you know, just looking at it and, and wondering, well, how are the stones cut? You know, how are the, how's the pillar made? You know, all yeah. this stuff. So all of a sudden that seems very interesting. 
um, you said this fir- dream first came to you um, how long ago? That was the first time you can remember having one? Yeah, I, I think I was probably about 22 or 23. Hmm. Um, so that would have been uh, like 11 years ago. What was the uh, transitional periods you were going through in your life at the time? Um, was that you were just getting out of the military or... No, actually, um, I joined a little bit later. So that would have been the year that I went in. Um, Gotcha. And unfortunately, I don't remember if this would have been before or after I joined. Um, Hmm. I don't, I'm not sure. I could very easily see it Um, coming before as you were considering joining. That there's something in there. Yeah, that was a very busy year for me because I, I got married that year and I joined the military that year. Um. And in joining the military, I left the only job I had ever had since I was 17. Mm. And, you know, there's just a few different things going on. But. Yeah. Big, big tra- transitional period in your life. So th- that's that's part of what I'm seeing in here in terms of thematically is. So I'm, having, I'm having a hell of a time wrapping it up. You brought me a good one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the idea of. Trying to decide what's important to you and why. Yeah, I mean, when you when you got into the military, was it for the purpose of, you know, doing a GI Bill or or was it? Um, you know, because some people go, I want an education, I'll go serve and I'll get it, and that's why they serve. Did you have a different yeah. motivation or? Yeah, you know that I'd say that that that's pretty accurate. Um, I got my associate's degree through community college, hmm. and then I went to um, go to a four year school and. Before I, you know, when I got the first proposed bill, I said, uh, you know, I can't pay for this. And I, I didn't like the idea of student loans, so I didn't go. Um, and then four years passed between when I graduated from community college and when I joined the army. Mm. Um, and I, that was, my, you know, pro- my primary motivation was to to be able to continue going to, to school. Okay. I mean, that fits. If I had to guess, I would have, well, that's why I suggested it. I'm like, okay, this occurred to me. That's probably related to it. So definitely your, the destination you've ended up in almost by happenstance, by a roadside happenstance is, is actually, you've, you've discovered something of intense interest, but in order to get there, you had to go through a very stark representation that you are going to die someday like all these other people did, which sometimes keys our mind in, well, how do I want to live? What does it, what does it mean to live a good life knowing that it's going to be over at some point? There's something in there. I don't know if any of that's resonating with you in terms of the progression of the scene. Yeah. I think that, um, I I think that might be a fair interpretation. Um, I think it's interesting that, um, two things stick out to me about the death part of it. One is that at this point in my life, nobody I had known had died yet. Mm -hmm. The other thing that sticks out to me about it is that, um, as a person, I'm somebody who's not afraid of death. Um, and of course this might change the closer you get, but one thing that I've always reflected on in life is that, you know, I've only lived 34 years, but it seems like I've been alive a really long time. <laughs> yeah. and it seems like I've lived a really good life. So I've said to several people, I said, if I died tomorrow, there's no reason to be sad. Like I've, I've done a lot of stuff and I've, I've lived a really good life. Even at this point, I would love to live to be very old, like my grandparents, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, I don't see the sadness or fear in death that I think a lot of other people do. Yeah. And I think maybe that might account for the mood of it a little bit. Um, you know, kind of the, the, the nature of it, the dream. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Because this was, yeah, this is very much not a dream imagery or emotional content of, of fear of being afraid of death and knowing you're, there's, there's two, two kinds of people that, well, not two, but there's more than two kinds, but the broader, broader strokes of there's the person who, has the sudden realization, Oh my God, I'm going to die someday. And they're terrified and they're fearful of, of this inevitability and they do everything they can to avoid it. And they're very careful and all this other stuff. There's some people who go, I know my time is limited, so I don't want to waste it. I'm going to use it well 
in, in a way that's, you know, it's, it's not fear of death that motivates you to make the most of what you got as, as much as the knowledge that it's coming. So the, your conception of death at that time may have been more impersonal, no names on the gravestones. They're all uniform. Could, could be anybody. They could all be the same type of person. Uh, or at least the gravestones are not individuated. They're not distinctive. There's not some tall, some short, some gray, some blue, you know, whatever. Um, so they're more, yeah, more of a, an impersonal relationship with the concept of death and maybe even knowing you would feel, face a risk of it serving in the military. Like you're going to have to confront this one way or another because shit happens and w w people will shoot at you. <laughs> you can yeah. shoot back, yeah. you know? So, I mean, that makes it, but then th to, to have this keep coming back over time as something, something you feel like you need to continue to see. Th there was something you'd said in your, you know, like you like to master one thing and then move on to another. Um, it would make sense that there would be multiple towers. Like if your dream imagery had been more along those lines of, Oh, and in the distance, I see more towers and I'm drawn to them too. Um, you got to stop. I'm going to let you outside in a minute, just a minute. <laughs> um, but this is the same pattern over and over again. Like you need to re-examine your choices, but you don't seem to, to me today to be regretting your, um, decision to, to get into, you know, philosophy and psychology and explore these things. You're having a good old time. So it doesn't seem yeah. to fit. It doesn't seem like you'd need to return to that imagery for that reason to re-examine that question. Yeah. Like I said, the only thing that ever changes is the door to the mansion being opened or closed. And that happened. Um, that would have happened after I left the military. Um, yeah, then that's the only, that's the, really the only variation in, in the dream. Yeah, and it is very interesting why the door open. It's like, um, it, what I considered it when you first said it is the first thing that popped into my mind was something in your mind wanting to make it more enticing. Like, look, look, look I opened the door for you. Go, 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 go check it out. Like you might be. I, I, I remember go ahead. when I woke up the first time from the dream and the door was open feeling scared mm. because I think up until that point, the, the, you know, the six or so other times that I'd had the dream, um, it seemed very certain that nobody was there. Yeah. And then when I had the dream and suddenly the door was open in the dream, it still never occurred to me that anybody was there. But when I woke up, I thought, Oh, well, if the door was open this time, who opened the door? Right. You know, and that, that was after you woke up, though, like in the dream, you didn't have that experience? No, in the dream, yeah. it seemed completely normal. But after I woke up, it, it seemed, that seemed a little bit strange to me. You got to stop. He wants me to throw his toy. Of course he does. <laughs> he woke up from his nap and now he's ready to play. Come on. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. If you won't be quiet, you got to get back in my lap. Calm down. Um, an open door feels to me and you could say if it feels to you, but like an invitation, almost like an enticement, like, and that might make you feel weird about it afterwards. Like doors open that strange as if there's something. Yeah. It's, I, it's weird. Cause I have a mixed feeling about it. Right. Because in my dream, the thought process is always tower than mansion. But in my waking life, it's always, oh, the next time I get into that dream, I want to explore the mansion. But then the first time the door was opened, it freaked me out a little bit. Yeah. You know? So it, it's kind of a strange mixed feeling where it's like, in my waking life, that's all I want to do is uh, the next time I have this dream, I'm going to go into the mansion instead because I want to know what the inside of that looks like. Um, and now it's pretty much, you know, it, it doesn't bother me because it's, it, you know, it's happened enough times, but the first time it was, it was a little bit jarring. You said it was about, have you ever noticed over time, any pattern to life circumstances that seem to coincide with the dream coming back? Like when's, when's the last time you can remember having it? Uh, the last time I had it, that would have been, I want to say it's about eight months ago. Okay. Um, and I don't remember anything specific happening. 
I never remember anything specific happening throughout my life when it comes up. It almost seems yeah. like just as I'm starting to forget that I had it, then I'll have it again. You know? Mm. Oh, yeah, there it is. But maybe it's some manner of um persistent I hesitate to say fear, but concern like um what am I trying to say? There's something to that idea of, oh, just about when I'm about to forget it, it won't when it, when it seems like it's gone for long enough and it's not relevant anymore, there's something that's hard to let go. And there's, there might be something that's related to the enticement of even in your own mind, opening the door to the changing something in the dream, but in a way that makes you, what am I trying to say? Like there's maybe some unexpressed part of you that you've not hidden consciously, but maybe, um, not suppressed either. The only other detail I can offer yeah, um, regarding the door is that it seems strange to me. The mansion is, it's this big place, you know, it's obviously a huge building, yeah. but the door is a normal front door. It's just a regular you know, it seems oh. to me like there should be a big double door. There right. Be yeah. Something. Yeah. But no, that's kind of what I imagine. It's a normal sized door. <laughs> um, and it just, it's just opened inward to the point where um, it looks like it might not eat, like it, it got taken off its hinges. I can't see the door at all, but it's yeah, just black. Yeah, I can't okay. see into the building at all. Yeah. That always seems strange to me. It's just a regular house door, but on this big mansion. Yeah. That is, that is odd. I wonder if this is just a puzzle that neither one of us can see very clearly. We've identified a lot of symbols there. Or if I'm just pooped today, I got up way, way, way early. I've already done another interpretation earlier today. And sometimes, sometimes the brains are firing all, on all cylinders. Usually by the time I get to the end, I can see a little bit of a story arc and we tie it together. And this one is... It's so many discrete elements and they each seem to have some relevance to some aspect of your life, but there's no full through line. There's no story. There's no explanation for the need of recurrence. What, what I, what I would hope to give you is not only that narrative, like here's, here's to sum up what, what I think it's describing, but some understanding of it that is relevant enough that that solves the mystery enough that un, um, identifies the pattern sufficiently that it's no longer necessary to have it again. It doesn't seem to be that much of a distressing dream. So, and it doesn't come back every night. So is it necessary it, to try and stop it? I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, you know, because I think, you know, it's, I, I can imagine it being hard to interpret because there's no other characters in the dream. You know, there's no people. So that that takes something away from it. That's true. But Very like solitary earlier experience. Too, you know, just the kind of person that I am, I'm the kind of person that loves mystery. You know, I, that's why I like philosophy. So I can think about the idea of what is time or yeah. where did the universe come from or where did... So this idea of having things that are that are out there that I can't understand and I might never be able to understand. Um, not only do those things not bother me, those are the things that I really enjoy thinking about. And maybe it's yeah. just a reflection of that in some way. But. Could be. I mean, that's definitely a possible understanding. I wish it was a, I wish it felt more certain. I want to give you, yeah. I want to give you something more certain. Uh, there was, um, you know, it was about, oh, what's it? Have you ever seen the, um, uh, Pee Wee Herman's Big Adventure. A uh, long time ago. Yeah. Long time ago. Yeah. When I was, when I was a kid too. I mean, that was from when I was a kid in the eighties. Um, but, uh, you know, he gets picked up by the truck driver and she says it were many years ago. And it was about 100 episodes ago that I had my first experience of, I can't make heads or tails of this thing. It was episode 19. I think called, I called it going nowhere. Um, because he had, he had this wonderfully strange experience of being, restrained to a chair 
in the middle of the sand of a broken down Roman Colosseum, and this little old babushka lady with a with a with a kerchief over her neck approached, pulled a pair of wire clippers out, and started snipping off the tips of his fingers, out of which sand flowed. Uh. Couldn't couldn't make heads or tails out of any of that stuff. It was just the most wonderfully bizarre sequence yes, of images. It seems like it should have a lot of symbolism that that leads to some meaning, um, but yeah. it's hard to pick apart. Yeah that's, yeah, that's the way I feel about this one. And that's why I thought it would be interesting to bring it on is because, you know, having it so many times and having it occur the same way every time, it seems like the symbolism is very strong, but I, I can't make heads or tails of it. So yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. What, what I would be interested to hear is if our analyzing it, breaking it down, seeing a little bit more of the details, getting a little bit of feedback on the ideas changes the nature of the dream the next time he has it you have it or if it is exactly the same and the door's wide open and nothing changes um yeah or if it just never comes back because it, we looked at it enough to render it less mysterious so it doesn't need mm -hmm. to be remembered and re-experienced i, I yeah, genuinely I feel that... there's got to be something there to the the reason why it needs to come back why you need to return to that image what unresolved uncrystallized conception is uh, teasing around your head. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see if, if it does come back or if it changes or, or whatnot. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, you know, it, I, I don't know why I, my brain feels that I need to have it either. It's a, you know, it's, yeah. it's a strange thing. That is, that is kind but of the, that's the have, proof in the pudding. I think you have di identified a lot of things in it that do relate um, to, you know, who I am as a person. So um, maybe it will be the case that I'll be able to to pick apart some things on my own the next time it happens. Yeah. Uh, hopefully the um, dream experience changes. You're able to have a different experience of it now that some of the elements have been more fully explained. If, if that makes sense. Uh, and you might come away from, if it returns, uh, you might come away from it with some sudden understanding that wasn't possible until you dreamt, dreamt it again. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm brain dead. So <laughs> I'm getting tired. It's the middle of the afternoon. That's okay. Not your fault. Uh, I don't know that I could have done any better with this had I been more awake uh, or, or less, less tired from a long day, but uh, I, it always a fascinating experience. I'm glad we got to talk for an, about an hour beforehand and then jump into this for an hour and a half and really look at some of these elements and get, get an understanding of where they came from. So hopefully it's been just yeah. in general, a, a beneficial experience to you. Yeah, no, it's, it's been a lot of fun for me and um you know, like I said, I'm somebody who likes the mystery, so I'm not at all disappointed that we didn't <laughs> get to the bottom of something. I, I like the fact that it will continue on for at least a while, a while more. So good. Yeah. Deal. And I, and I can claim a, it's still a higher than 99% success rate. Uh, even after missing, <laughs> you just missing a couple, couple of them in terms of a grand narrative. So, um, well, if you feel satisfied for now, uh, pending, pending future results, you want to, we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Maybe job. kept it long enough to give you another one and we can, uh, we can pick it apart and get an answer out of one of those. Sure. Yeah. And I'm, I'd always be happy to hear from you again in the future in terms of, um, has anything changed? I mean, not a lot of people yeah. get back to me. Some people do. Um, I have heard from some people who, because of my, uh, our collaborative analysis, their recurrent dreams did change and they were allowed to progress beyond areas where they got previously stopped. So Maybe there is something of that nature in here. You needed to get a better idea of what this was starting to show you, and then you can move on. Maybe there's actually more to this dream that you haven't been able to have yet. That would be fascinating. I, yeah, 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 that would be. I'm excited. <laughs> Good deal. Okay, well, uh, by way of, of parting here, I'm going to say this has been our friend Joel Bouchard. I can't read my own handwriting. Uh, from West New York State, and he is a PhD student, Army vet, musician, podcaster with the show from nowhere to nothing uh, available on uh, all of your favorite po podcasting platforms. For my part, I'll say, uh, wow, 
Would you kindly like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Always need more uh, volunteer dreamers and uh, viewers for the program. Uh, 16 currently available works of historical dream literature. The most recent Dreams and Their Meaning by Horace G. Hutchinson. Wow, I'm really getting brain dead. End of the day here. Uh, you can find all this and more at BenjaminTheDreamWizard.com. Uh, all 16 works, uh, downloadable MP3 versions of, of the podcast and stuff. And I'll just say once again to our friend, Joel, thank you for being here. It's, it's been a good talk all the way around. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Good deal. And everybody out there, thanks for listening. <laughs>